just confirming. Okay, okay. Good, good, and we'll be calling board meeting to order in one moment. So could we please just hold this moment while SPD takes a five. And for a five second pause, I will call us to order. Okimao P. Sim Nitisi Nikason. Welcome. My name is Zachary DeWolf. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm now calling the July 8th, 2020 regular board to order at 1 p.m. We live and go to a school, you live and go to school and serve in a city that is the ancestral homeland of the Duwamish people, the Muckleshoot Nation, and the Suquamish Nation. We acknowledge them as Consonians of this land since time immemorial. As guests, and in many of our cases as settlers on this land, we extend our deepest gratitude and respect to their ancestors and elders, past, present, and future. We'll now move to the roll call. Ms. Wilson Jones, roll call, please. Director Hampson? Here. Director Harris? Here. Director Hersey? Director Hersey, I think you uh, may be muted still. I will, I will come back around. Director Mack? Here. Director Rankin? Here. Director Rivera-Smith? Present. Director uh, Hersey, are you there yet? I do see that Director Hersey has joined in. I, he had some feedback noise that I think um, was interviewing, but um, and then Director DeWolf. Present. OK, um, it looks like Director Hersey is uh, maybe having a technical issue if you want to come back around once he rejoins. Superintendent Juneau is also joining us for today's meeting and additional staff will be briefing the board as we move through the agenda. This meeting is being held remotely per the governor's proclamation prohibiting meetings such as this one from being held in person. And I'll note that members of the public may also be joining via phone or online streaming through Teams. We will not be asking members of the public to identify themselves other than when we move into public testimony, but thank you to those joining us. To facilitate this meeting, I will ask all participants to ensure you are muted when you are not speaking. Staff may be muting participants to address feedback and ensure we can hear directors and staff. The chat function on Microsoft Teams will not be used for today's meeting. Uh, Director Hersey, have you have you joined? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Oh, great. Okay, cool. Ms. Wilson Jones, if you could just make sure that he's counted in our roll call. I will now turn over uh, to Superintendent Juneau for her comments. Thank you, President DeWolf and directors. Um, I just want to, I'll make brief comments. I just want to first um, thank our staff, educators, and families um, for supporting and helping our students learn during the COVID closure. We learned a lot um, during the closure about teaching and learning, I think, across the city um, and just look forward to next steps beyond that. But just want to make sure I give a specific shout out to our families who really stepped up and um, supported their children while we were in that era of remote learning. I also want to thank all the educators um, who are stepping up to teach summer school. We have a few numbers that we can share. Um, our total students actually did turn out to be 14,997 of our students are participating in summer school, which is, of course, as you know, about six times more than we usually do during summer school. And I really just want to thank the staff who um, are helping out as well. We have 250 elementary staff who are helping teach summer, the summer of learning. Uh, we have 50 middle school staff and 45 high school staff for a total of 345 staff who are teaching 14,997 students. And so I think that's a significant lift for our district and just want to thank everybody who played a part in making sure that our summer of learning is more robust than we've ever done before. Um, 
I also want to thank all the participants that were engaged in our back to school engagement teams for thinking through with us all of the complexities and providing a great base of values upon which to build our system as we look forward. Um, as you know, we held a board work session last week and presented the potential plans for Seattle Public Schools. At that time, the board asked us to do more engagement, particularly with African-American families and students. And so I just want the board to know that engagement is being planned and will be held over the next few weeks. Um, we'll send you the plan once it's kind of put together. And also there's a team that's starting to dig into um, the nitty gritty around space. There was a team that visited and conducted a walkthrough at Wing Luke Elementary yesterday just to take a look and kind of get a feeling for how things might have to be configured going forward into the fall. It's not as easy as just saying, put a desk over there and put a desk over here. There's just a lot of logistics to move through, even just with our facilities. Many, many, many details to work out. And so that work is starting in earnest as well, because we know that we're going to have to uh, pay attention to the health guidance and make sure that we are doing the social distancing within our school buildings as well. Um, we, the results from our intent to enroll survey are now at that, that closed last Thursday and they're being compiled. So we'll soon have more information, but the preliminary data seems to be holding as we presented at the work session um, with about 8% of our families wanting to stay in a 100% remote uh, learning option. And so while that's great that so many, uh, of our families want to make sure that their student is experiencing some sort of in-person learning, that uh, small percentage will impact our space capacity. And you know, at one point we thought we might be able to bring back our very early grades um, at, at uh, maybe four times a week. And we're not sure whether that will hold depending on the numbers as we still dig into the data about um, how we might be able to plan our intent is still to have um, in-person instruction at least twice a week for everybody in the district. And so that will remain our intent as we continue to get more uh, detailed numbers and work through that process. So we will plan to have a hybrid model that we're calling it that will have two times a week of in-person instruction and then of course hopefully working with our community-based organizations to find places for students in those off days and then uh, of course a 100 percent remote option that will offer some flexibility for families who may not feel safe um, sending their students back to school at this point in time so just a lot more to go um, but that still remains our intent to make sure that we are um, providing those two options for our community. Um, so moving forward, <clears throat> um, I would, there's more engagement to do. Um, we're still digging into the numbers so that we can get more clear. And again, as you remember from the work session that we'll be following up with a survey in August to get uh, again, more clear on um, who's coming to school and who wants to stay home and do 100% remote learning. And so we'll be very, very clear by the time August rolls around. And by the time school starts, our building should be in pretty good shape as far as um, having the social distancing requirements and all the health and safety issues that need to be in place. And so um, a lot of work could be done over the summer. Um, we, I think, have um, starting our negotiations with SEA and our union to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as um, what working conditions will need to be when we come back and the kind of health and safety that need to be in place. We want to make sure that we are continuing to lead with science and the health guidance that's put out from the state. And so um, hopefully those are fruitful and that uh, we can find a place where we can all um, agree on um, these models going forward. And as you know, that the plan will come back um, to the board, at least for final approval in August. And I'm sure we'll have a lot more discussions in between now and then. And I think that is due for August 12th. So that's kind of just an update on where we are as far as fall planning. It is important for people to know that we are moving forward with 
the hybrid model of at least two times a week in person and the option with 100% remote learning. It's important to remember that we have that in place as well in case, you know, if the virus keeps spiking as it is, or if there are times that we need to pop out of, uh, we might have to close our buildings and pop back into in person that we have that model. And, um, you know, our plan, of course, that we are doing with our attuned partners as well um, will help us determine what kind of professional development and what, what do we need and sort of provide a playbook for us about what, um, what does that online model look like? Because we, we know that we need to be better moving into the fall and our commitment is that those, who, those students, those families who choose to stay at home with 100% remote learning will have a better experience than they did this year. Um, I also want to just thank Amijah Smith. She continues to come back and host community meetings with black families and the superintendent. Um, and it helps me to really hear and learn from um, African-American families about how we can be better and do better. And so um, I, I appreciate her leadership in that effort. And then also, I just want you to know that on July 1st, I started my third year as superintendent for Seattle Public Schools. And as I began going into my third year, I just really looked forward to continuing the work of implementing Seattle Excellence, our strategic plan. I know that we have a lot of work to do, and we, but I also know that we have a lot of great partners that are here to help us. And so I am really grateful for their continuing efforts um, to work with us. I just know that as we move into this next year and all my conversations with national superintendents and regional superintendents, um, this is not easy work. There are no easy decisions. There is not a perfect outcome, um, but I do believe that Seattle Public Schools will once again um, be a leader in this effort and that we're going to provide a quality uh, education system for everybody who um, is involved with our system. So just appreciate the work that We've done this far. I want to thank staff again um, and just look forward to continuing our work with the board to make sure that we come up with a model that's going to work for a lot of our families in the system. So thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Juneau. <clears throat> Greatly appreciate the update and uh, sharing some of the background and uh, what our folks in our community can expect from the district and the board in the coming weeks and months as we look at the fall 2020 learning uh, reopening plan. At this time, we will now, uh, we have now reached the consent portion of today's agenda. So may I have a motion for the consent agenda, please? This is Director Hampson, so moved. Second, Director Harris. Thank you, directors. Approval of the consent agenda has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. Do directors have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Those abstaining? The consent agenda has passed unanimously. We have now reached the public testimony portion of the, excuse me, we have not reached the public testimony agenda uh, portion of our agenda as it is 113 and that begins at 130. So I would like to offer if directors would like to provide director comments at this time, uh, we can start director comments now. Uh, prior to our 1.30 public comment portion. So, Director Hampson. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to make use of the time that we have. Hinikari uh, Gwin, uh, this is Director Hampson. A big sigh and big uh, breath. Uh, it's, uh, I think, believe been a pretty tough week, a couple weeks since we were last uh, together and covered an immense amount of territory uh, in terms of, of um, board action and introduction. And we have a um, large amount of work to do today. Um, uh, there are have been some really difficult 
things happening in our country, in our uh, community, in our city, um, uh, in our in various communities all around the the country. It's it's enough that um, I'm I'm pretty overwhelmed to even try to pinpoint any particular thing. Um, and I think one thing that that I tend to do, I think we all have our coping mechanisms in these um, situations and. Uh, I, I tend to, uh, one of the coping mechanisms I have is to try to stay focused on, on work that I feel that, that we're, we're making some progress. And um, so I, I'm grateful for um, my fellow board members um, for continuing to, to push forward on the work that's encompassed in the resolution and support of um, our black students. And I'm excited about that work. It continues to come up. I'm glad that the community is engaged in that work. Uh, and I'm excited to move into August, um, digging deeper into the full spectrum of policies and uh, procedures that uh, impact the ways in which law enforcement comes into play in the lives of our of our students and our students' families, um, and to do everything that we can to uh, lessen and eventually eliminate um, that altogether. Uh, because it isn't something that I believe should be part of the, the educational um, system. Um, I'm also um, really uh, happy to report in terms of um, our audit and finance uh, committee that we we have a new hire um, that we're excited about that has a, a good, um, a strong data background. So hopefully um, folks will, will begin to get to know him. We're also, everyone has been participating in our external audit a rev external review of internal audit with Moss Adams. And um, my understanding is that work is going well. Um, and I'm excited about the opportunity that that presents for us to have a more comprehensive uh, enterprise-wide approach to uh, our, our um, risk assessment and then our review um, and accountability um, as it pertains to our the function of internal audit. I'm extremely grateful to um, Andrew, Andrew Medina um, we've also been working on a racial equity tool that we want to roll out um, very soon um, that has, has been a long time coming and we've been revising that and, and looking forward to putting that into place as well. So um, those are kind of my highlights, but uh, just to community out there that might be listening, uh, I appreciate every phone call and every email and uh, the ways in which you're all helping us stay connected to what is happening in our in our communities and we and um and my heart is with every um person that is is going through a lot um in in the most horrific ways with respect to death in our community but also trauma um i know that that the the rates of of trauma based on racism and um other kinds of of uh affronts to to our humanity are are frequent in these days, and um, and I hope everyone is able to take um, some time to to take a breath for themselves and focus on some self healing because we do have to stay uh, healthy and um, uh, as healthy as we can and as collect as we can to to come back and, and keep pushing forward. Uh, thank you so much, Pinikiki. Thank you, Director Hampson. Director Harris. I'd like to pass right now, if I could, please. Thank you, sir. Of course. Thank you. Director Hersey. Sure. <clears throat> um, first, thank you to everyone around. And when I say everyone, I mean all of our folks in the community um, around all of the advocacy that has been happening in light of all of the atrocities that have been happening in our world over the past few months. Um, I think that as we head into whatever school looks like next year, um, that we as a board, I just want to say, are looking forward to continuing to collaborate with the various student organizations, community organizations, and parents and families and PTAs and so many other groups that are really trying to make sense of how not only they fit into this world and to the city, but how how can they help? So just want to come from a place of gratitude not only for our community but also for our staff at john stanford who have been working tremendously in terms of figuring out how do we not only continue to provide all the services that we traditionally have but how to do that in this in this scary context um as we not only fight 
a pandemic, but also racism within our own schools. So again, just thank you to all of the work that has been done. Looking forward to the work that will continue and just hope everybody, you know, as we look into this last meeting, quote unquote, for the summer, just making sure that everybody takes this opportunity to spend time with your family, tell your kids that you love them and really just take some time for you. Thank you, Director Harrison. Director Mack? Um, yeah, thank you. I, I, I recognize we have 10 minutes before public comment starts, and um, I'd also like to uh, potentially have the opportunity at the end of the meeting, um, at, because I, I always like to hear uh, the testimony, um, and then we also speak to a lot of issues on the um, on the agenda, so I'll, I'll be addressing various topics there. But I'll uh, I want to echo um, the recognition of the massive uh, challenges uh, going on in our uh, community, and um, I mean we're in a completely unprecedented time. Um, we don't know what the fall is going to look like, and um, I want to uh, also extend gratitude and, and increased um, support for increased collaboration around all of this work um, and uh, doing it with grace and in support of each other. And so I, I appreciate all of that, those efforts that have been going on. Um, I wanted to share with you all, but I may not have shared with you all that, yeah, as you know, I'm I sit on the legislative committee for WASDA, and uh, we've had several of our meetings where uh, we work through the position statements um, that will be presented to the full body for the legislative agenda uh, for the organization. Um, and that, that'll, that meeting come up uh, in a couple of months, I believe. I can't remember the date, but. Um, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, these issues that we are uh, facing across the country and that we've been discussing here are also being um, discussed and, and focused on and, and supported in that legislative agenda as well. So um, I'm grateful to continue to be a part of that work and, um, and look forward to, I believe, Director Hersey come the fall uh, being there at the was the um, conference, which I think is going to be virtual, like everything, um, uh, when that when that comes up. And um, I'll go ahead and and pause there because I don't have anything else that's coming uh, specifically to mind to address um, and allow others to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, I kind of forgot that board comments is a thing, so I'm not <laughs> specifically prepared, but I wanted to share um, something that I'm like sitting with and thinking about a lot lately is the um, the kind of constant state of tension that we're all in. And for me personally, I'm noticing, you know, I flip back and forth between like just total despair and frustration and then also feeling really hopeful and I just kind of wanted to say that out loud, I guess, as I'm sure people might be feeling the same way. And um, that that in going forward specifically to school opening, uh, that there's the greater tension around all of it of um, uh, kind of greater expectations for kids to be in school and the pressure being put on everybody right now to keep the economy <laughs> in big quotes going and i i just want to give voice to the fact i guess that we all as a system and as as colleagues and as all of us working together i just kind of want to state the need for us to be really hyper aware of um the pressures that will cause us to uh to cause different groups to turn against each other 
And just kind of note that like, there's going to be a lot that's going to come up that's going to pit parents against teachers and, you know, forget about students and all of these different things. And that, that need for parents and families to be working and to preserve their livelihoods and their careers is, is so critical but so is the need to protect the health and safety of our students and educators. And, you know, the, the best solution would be for somebody in, in higher levels of government to just pay everybody to stay home and let this virus, you know, run its, get just, just be done with it, but that's not going to happen. So I, I just kind of wanted to put that out there, I guess. And as a board director and as a parent and as a former educator, I find myself sitting in those different spaces at, at different times and having feeling the tendency to be, you know, really mad at parents for demanding to be back in person and then being frustrated with teachers for not wanting to be in the classroom. And and I kind of keep within myself switching around the roles and the point of view. And I have to remind myself that that is all um, uh, external forces trying to um, pit us against each other. And I just want to, I'm trying to remind myself and people that I'm engaged with to just to be focused on doing what's best for the health and safety of our communities as a whole. And that includes our students and our educators and families and parents and, you know, business owners and everybody else. Um, and it's it's hard because as I think someone else, uh, I think uh, the superintendent mentioned, there's not any decision that's that's easy. Um, so I would just to piggyback on what some of my colleagues have said already about collaboration. And um, I guess I'm just kind of taking this moment to, to kind of <laughs> extemporate, uh, but to, for us to remember that our our role here is to the educational system, but that the, also the role that the public schools play in our greater society. And just to throw in an extra thing about my concern is that in the in the the we've been getting a lot of emails about childcare specifically, and it is so important. But that um, childcare providers and childcare workers are also not expendable, um, and that their health and safety is absolutely critical. So I know that we have so many uh, thoughtful conversations and a lot of data going into all of this, but I just want to put out that reminder that um, for us to be a healthy structure and system, um, that we have to kind of be in it together. Um, and then on a more specific note, uh, the work around the policies connected to the, uh, the resolution supporting our Black students and um, my amendments related to special education, I am just really uh, continuing to look forward to diving into the work around specifically the restraint and isolation policy and how it overlaps with special education. And I've been having um, some great conversations with members of the community and um, uh, child psychiatry specialists and experts and uh, folks within SPS. And I'm really excited about the direction that, that we're going and um, appreciative of this continuing work. And uh, uh, Director Hersey and I are gonna have a, like a listening community session with the special education um, PTSA coming up. And uh, I think that that's more than enough for me at this point. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Yvette Smith. Um, yeah, no, with, with less than a minute to go, I'll just um, hold until later for my comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I just want to quickly, before we start the uh, public comment portion, my only comments today are I held a community meeting with uh, LGBTQ students, families, and educators last night. We had to cut it short because uh, folks came into the meeting uh, and we're using very transphobic, homophobic, racist, and sexist um, comments uh, and songs uh, on the Zoom meeting to make people feel unsafe. So we ended up canceling the meeting and we will be re rescheduling that. Um, but I think if, if anything, it just makes more clear that it is so important the resolution we pass as a board and I continue to thank and have gratitude for my board for taking such a, um, uh, an important and exciting step 
um, because obviously um, our students and families and educators are still uh, feeling harm. Um, so with that, it is 1.30 p.m. We will next move to public testimony. Board Procedure 1430BP provides the rules for providing testimony. I ask that speakers are respectful of these rules, which will be shown on the screen while I explain the process for public testimony today. Public testimony will be taken remotely today with speakers participating by phone or through Microsoft Teams. I thank you all for your, your patience, mm -hmm. uh, your grace with, with our process for this. The testimony list for today's meeting is available on the school board website as part of the agenda posting for today. Please remain muted until your name is called to provide testimony. And when your name is called, please ensure you're unmuted in Microsoft Teams and begin your testimony. If you have joined by phone, please be sure you have unmuted on the device you are calling from and also press star six to unmute yourself on the conference call line. Each speaker will have a two minute speaking time. And once your name is read, staff will begin a timer which will be displayed on the screen in Microsoft Teams. For both those participating in Microsoft Teams and by phone, a chime will sound when your time is exhausted and the next speaker will be called. Ms. Wilson-Jones, will you read off the testimony speakers, please? Um, first up for public testimony is Chris Jackins. We are, um, if you could hold for just a second, we are um, currently loading our testimony timer. Of course. Chris, thank you. Give us a moment while we. Ellie, just let me know when you're ready to. Uh, it looks it looks like we are are ready now. Oh, oh, never mind. I apologize. We are one not second. Ready again. <laughs> we are ready. First up for testimony, up we, for have testimony we have Chris Jackins. Jackins. Okay, okay. My name is Chris, My name Jackins. Is Chris Jackins. Box 8403, Seattle 9824. On the amendment on the to amendment board policy, board policy 1430 and and I think we're having a technical, 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 technical issue. Um, um, issue. Um, Tina, um, go ahead and pause the time, time for a second. For a second. Time is paused. Okay. I'm paused. Um, I'm paused. Um, Tina, can you, Tina, can you um, stop sharing, stop your, sharing your system audio? Because audio is causing a problem. Everything is getting doubly said. Am I back on now? One moment, Mr. Jackins. We are just one moment. Okay, thank you. Ellie, do I share without the audio? Yes, please without, um, share without the audio and I will go ahead and sound a, a tone when we get to the end of the testimony. Thank you everybody for your flexibility. Um, Ms. Wilson-Jones, if you could just let Mr. Jackins know when he can restart. Tina, could you please restart the time? And Mr. Jackins, you can go ahead and start your testimony. All right, thank you again. My name is Chris Jackins. Box 84063, Seattle 98124. On the amendments to Board Policy 1430 and Board Procedure 1430 BP audience participation, it appears that public speakers are no longer prohibited from addressing personnel matters. Is this true? On the budget, as I noted in my comments in the budget hearing earlier today, the Board should vote no on the budget. The Board should delay action to consider public input from the state required hearing and generate budget analyses for some alternatives. On the website contract, three points. Number one, how much disruption to website access is anticipated? 
Number two, the board report discusses ADA accessibility and a previous lawsuit against the district. It was not clear from the report whether the district specifically sought input from blind users. Number three, the plan includes 200 hours for migration. Is this 200 hours of one staff person, and is it enough? On the board resolution opposing landmarking of Rainier Beach High School, five points. Number one, this resolution is an horrendous mistake. Number two, the history of Rainier Beach deserves respectful consideration as a city landmark. Number three, instead the district has hired a consultant to claim that Rainier Beach has no important history. Number four, the same consultant and the same district staff wrongly claimed Wilson Pacific had no important native history. Number five, please respect the history of Rainier Beach. Please vote no. Thank you very much. Next up for public testimony will be Kelly Smith. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Kelly Smith. I'm a parent of three school-aged children at Leshai Elementary. And along with many other members of my community, we demand transparency and accountability for the abrupt removal of Principal Moland, our first year principal at Leshai Elementary, a black community member, mother of five, and grandparent of a child at Leshai. Seattle Public Schools touts its equity policy 0030 since 2012, where you commit to actively recruit, hire, support, and retain employees, including administrators who reflect the demographics of the students they serve. SPS did recruit and hire Ms. Moland, but your adherence to your own policy ends there. We teach students that equity is not the same as equality. When championing equity, we differentiate to ensure everyone has what they need to thrive. When our community asked district leaders how they specifically supported Ms. Moland at Leshai, the response from leadership was that she received support commensurate with other principals. This is not equity. Leshai is a complex school serving a diverse population of students, including many students who are experiencing homelessness, students furthest from educational justice, and students who most need long-term, stable, supportive leadership. Ms. Moland hired by you for this position, the very person, a black woman from the neighborhood, who you purport to value and actively seek to hire, deserves so much more than the hostile supervisor work environment and lack of support, coaching, respect, and mentorship she received. This is structural racism. As you will hear from upcoming parents, enough is enough. We need real structural changes in the way black administrators are supported and retained. We want families and students to be part of this process, and we want supervisors with a proven track record of working respectfully and thoughtfully with communities of color. We want you to hire and retain principal supervisors who de whose demographics also reflect the communities they serve. Thank you. Next up for public testimony is Chris Pearson. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, great, uh, thank you. My name is Chris Pearson. I'm also the parent of two children at Leshai elementary and i actually plan to yield my time to another leshai parent uh natalie waseni hi i'm natalie waseni a parent to a kindergarten at leshai elementary and i yield my time to to gerald donaldson please Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Gerald Donaldson. Um, I have yielded my time, so do I have more time than I have? I'm the family support worker at Les High Elementary for the past 26 years. We demand transparency and accountability for the abrupt removal of Principal Moland. It is not about me, it's not about you, it's about the children. The process which uh, Ms. Smith spoke about uh, was terrible. Um, let me get this right here. Mr. Mr. Ruby's demeanor to our black leadership team on a meeting on 5-1 in which he scheduled himself for 30 minutes to make a speech and did not answer questions has been the meeting disrespectful, belittling and racist. A meeting was scheduled for 30 minutes which was reduced to five minutes and Mr. Ruby left without 
answering any questions. Educational research shows that black leaders are, are excluded from leadership and removed quickly, the, quickly than white um, leaders. Receive less coaching and mentoring and dealing with micro and the microaggressives associated with working in the public school system and Seattle Public Schools. Policy 0300, I don't even know if that was met. It's okay to have policies, but we have so many policies and if they're not practiced, what good are they? How much time do I have left? Because if someone to yield, I want to make sure I have my another couple of minutes. Is that true? Thank you. I uh, don't understand how much time, time time was yielded to me, and I didn't get my two minutes and their two minutes. That is that right, Ms. Wilson Jones? Do you want to explain the procedure here? Yes, when time is yielded, it um, is the t the clock continues to run, and so it is inclusive of all the speakers who may choose to speak during that time. So at this point, I would call the next speaker, who is Kay Lalish. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Kay Lalish, and I am the parent of one. Uh, uh, kindergartner at Leshy Elementary. And I think Gerald Donaldson um, can speak more eloquently about this than I can. So I'm going to uh, give my time to him. Can you pause the clock, Ms. Wilson Jones, until he's unmuted? Mr. Donaldson, the time has been yielded to you. If you'd like to take it, please unmute yourself now by through Teams or pressing star six. Okay, at this point, I think either Kay, we, you'll need to complete your time or- okay. Um, okay, I can keep going then. Um, Thank you yeah. for your patience. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I didn't plan that. I just uh, really appreciate what uh, Gerald Donaldson has said. Um, so I am a white woman and I realize that I have a lot of privilege and um, uh, we've heard a lot of talk about supporting black students and racial equity. And it just seems like letting go of Miss Milan really flew in the face of all of this stuff that we say is so important to us. Um, she is a black female principal in a majority minority school. And um, I was really excited to be a part of this community when I found out that this is the, that's the kind of school I was gonna go to where um, the people who are in charge actually look like the students at the school. Um, when she was let go with no explanation or warning, I had no idea what was going on. And I honestly thought she might've been getting, um, uh, uh, I don't know, getting a, an even better job because she was so amazing. Um, I heard that rumors later that she wasn't perfect, but that seems perfectly normal for a first year principal. Um, and I never had any issues with her. Um, this whole thing just feels really problematic. And um, I just know that uh, racism and unconscious bias is very real. And um, I'm really disappointed that this is the way it went down at Leshy Elementary. Thank you, my computers. Sorry for that, my, I just got back online. Next up for public testimony is um, Rebecca Kolodik. Rebecca Kolodik. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing the last name. K O L A D Y C Z.
If you've joined by phone, you may need to press star six to unmute, Rebecca. Susan Jones, I, I think we can move to the next. Next up will be Elijah Moyer. Hello, my name is Elijah Moyer. Can you hear me? We can. Yes, uh, my name is Elijah Moyer. I'm the parent of a uh, first grader at Lasha Elementary. I am also an immigrant and obviously a person of color. <clears throat> and um, I would like to begin by stating that I, we, in the Lashai community, demand accountability uh, for the abrupt removal of uh, Ms. Moland. Um, but back to my point, being a, uh, an immigrant and a person of color in this country and this community at large, um, we constantly deal with uh, racism, both overt and syst uh, systemic. So coming to Lashai and finding a school that was extremely diverse, that was led by a woman of color that I could identify with, that my child could identify with, was very encouraging. Um, you can imagine the gut punch that it felt that it felt like when um, I heard that she was simply just fired right in the middle of a pandemic, right in the middle of uh, a Black Lives Matter global movement. Um, this just felt like the good old days, right? The racism, the you guys don't get to get a long leash. You make a mistake, you're out. Um, I don't see the equity in this. I don't see the accountability in this. And I really, at this point, am very disappointed um, in the lack of adherence to policy and the lack of accountability. And I yield the rest of my time to Mr. Donaldson. Mr. Donaldson, I think you're muted. You might need to unmute Mr. Donaldson. We can't hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Lesha Elementary School is a school situated in a historically black neighborhood has already experienced at a removal of a black principal. This was followed by 10 years of white principals. Lesha Elementary School has had Ms. Moland a black leader for less than one year as a principal due to COVID-19. The community is wondering why this district is changing our administration during a rural white pandemic with no explanation or communication. Thank you, Gerald. Next up for public testimony is Kristen Lee. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hello, my name is Kristen Lay and I am a teacher of color at Olympic Hills Elementary School. I wanted to speak upon the subject of racial equity curriculum in schools. Specifically, I wanted to advocate for the necessity of time to explicitly teach about race weekly in the school district um, and in schools, the same way that we are required to teach reading, writing, math, and science every day. Along with another colleague of mine, I was given the opportunity to be in the teacher leader cadre specifically for racial equity in our school, Olympic Hills. Our responsibility over the summer, along with the curriculum committee and in our racial equity team, is to find, adopt, or develop a, a year-long curriculum or scope and sequence that explicitly teaches about race, racial injustices, uh, systemic racism, being anti-racist, ethnic studies, Black studies, and so much more that I can name. I name all these things while fully acknowledging that I and my colleagues have so much to learn as well and we are ready to do the work. I strongly believe that you should mandate an allotted time for all educators to have these race conversations with students. For example, if I'm required to teach CCC for about 100 to 120 minutes a day as a kindergarten teacher, or if I'm supposed to teach the mood meter daily and SEL weekly, then I should certainly be required to teach and facilitate conversations explicitly about race for at least 30 minutes to an hour per week as well, minimum. Director Hersey, you wrote a beautiful piece in the South Seattle Emerald last month where you stated, mandate black history and ethnic studies, develop a black studies curriculum. That is what we want to do and that is our goal. So thank you so much for calling out that need. Along with that, we also need the district to mandate for us an allotted time, space and support for us to learn to teach it intentionally, thoughtfully and reflectively. Again, please consider mandating an allotted time for teachers to have explicit race conversations on a weekly basis. This is one way I believe that we can, we can impact change and have done thoughtfully and urgently. Um, and this is how our students will be informed to impact racial equality. Thank you. 
Next up for public testimony is Ben Wilder. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Benson Wilder. I'm the PTA president at Lesha Elementary. I was the co-president the previous year and president for the incoming year. Um, I think you've heard very clearly from my fellow family members and community members that we demand transparency and accountability regarding the dismissal of Ms. Milland. Um, I thought it would be helpful too to uh, recount what we've tried to do so far to get a better understanding of the situation and to communicate. We understand that these are challenging times in the district and the board are under a lot of pressure with the COVID response. Um, nonetheless, um, to build, uh, as other speaker was referring to, in these uh, particularly troubling times, uh, we can't have trust without communication. Um, and we've seen very little of that as when it comes to this situation. So following Ms. Milan's dismissal, there was a letter sent from the building leadership team and representatives from um, union uh, at the school. And we, as a parent body, uh, set forward a brief statement that I'll, I'll share here. It was signed by over 60 different family members. Uh, as families of students who attend at Lesh Elementary, we share the concerns raised by our school's building leadership team, racial equity team, and SEA representatives regarding the abrupt dismissal of Principal Lisa Milland after less than one year of service to our community. We're perplexed and dismayed by the way this process has been handled. In the email from Superintendent Juno, Juno informing us a different principal would be placed at our school, there wasn't so much as an acknowledgement of Ms. Milland's tenure at Leshai and her service to our community. We stand with the members of Leshai staff and expect clear, transparent, and respectful communication with all of our stakeholders so we can together ensure the best outcomes for all Leshai students. Um, we have, after I sent that statement forward, I received an inquiry from Director Hersey. I appreciate that, asking if there had been a response. And we had a um, the previously previously scheduled chat with D Mr. DeWolf was the following week, and we had some follow up with him. Beyond that, we've received zero response um, from anyone in SPS leadership, um, and that and that was sent to uh, Superintendent Juno, Mr. Starosky, and many other officials. Thank you. Thank you. Next up for public testimony is Lisa Lotus. Lisa Lotus, if you have joined by phone, can you press star six to unmute now? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Hello. OK, great. Hi there. I'm a parent of a incoming fifth grader this year at Leshi Elementary. And um, my daughter is um, I'm a white woman. My daughter is biracial, presents as black. And um, I am wanting to demand transparency and accountability for the abrupt removal of our principal, Ms. Milan. I will say that um, as you understand what's going on here, um, it is a blatant display of, of systemic racism by not by adhering to the policies that you all have um, designed and approved, um, but had yet to organizationalize, is my understanding. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, the influence that Ms. Milan has had on our family directly. Uh, there was, I believe, one of the only Black Lives Matter rally vigils at the at um and you know outside of Leshai Elementary, and Ms. Milan was there and she gave a talk about um, was she you know uh, basically about her becoming a principal and how inspiring she was to other people. She was, how inspiring she, she was inspiring to my daughter and to me because she was describing almost exactly the personality of my daughter. And so to see a black woman principal and a black woman in a leadership position at her school, uh, this, was, this was monumental for our family and um, it really was a huge blow. It felt like my arm got cut off to just get that um, that um, absolutely atrocious email or uh, written correspondence in the mail from uh, Superintendent Juno. It was unacceptable. And um, that's it, thanks.
Next up for public testimony is Sam McKagan. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, I am the parent of a student at Leshy Elementary School and a student at Meany Middle School. I was part of the equity team that worked to transition Leshy Elementary from a segregated school with two programs into an integrated school with a single blended program. And I argued for that blended program before the school board five years ago. This spring, our black principal, Lisa Milland, was removed from her position in her first year as principal with no attempt to get, gather input from our community and no explanation to our community or to staff or even to her of why she was being removed. We demand transparency and accountability for the abrupt removal of Principal Milland. At the same time, the waiver allowing Leshy Elementary to teach Montessori math instead of using the district curriculum which has been renewed every year for the last decade was denied, along with directions from the district to dismantle our entire blended program, Montessori program, which has been a defining feature of our school for many years. This means that our teachers, many of whom have invested substantial time as well as their own money into Montessori training, are suddenly being told that their expertise is not valued and they must put it aside to learn a, to teach a whole new math curriculum along with teaching new subjects in the middle of a pandemic when they are also figuring out how to teach remotely. This means that our students who were used to one way of learning now have to rapidly adjust um, to a new curriculum and structure of schooling in addition to adapting to the stress and uncertainty of a pandemic and remote learning. We were told that the reason for dismantling the Montessori program was that no progress was being shown in student performance and the Montessori math wasn't illustrated the needing positive results for students furthest from educational justice. But there's no evidence that the problems of racial um, uh, inequity and in student performance would be improved with the standard math curriculum as inequity exists in many schools that use this curriculum. Instead, the disruption of rapidly changing our whole structure and curriculum is likely to exacerbate racial inequity in, rather than improvement improving it. If the district is serious about addressing racial inequity and in student performance, you should ask for input from our community about what support we need to improve performance using the resource, resources and expertise that already exist in our community, rather than forcing us to adapt on the spot to an externally imposed program and principle. Thank you. Thank you. Next up for public testimony is Heather Wild. Hi, my name is Heather Wild, and I'm a parent of a student of Leshy Elementary, and our family also demands accountability and transparency with respect to the firing of Ms. Moland. And I yield the rest of my time to Ms. Elma Horton. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Are you able to? Okay. My name is Elma Horton. I have been in the community over 50 years. My children went to Leshy School. My brother remodeled Leshy School. I'm in Leshy School often. I love that school. One of the local churches has just decided to adopt the school. And listening to all the testimonies, I'm really, really upset. And my heart is heavy because I started to work for the schools in the 60s. And, and during that time, we've gone back further or in as bad a shape as we was in the 60s because in 1969, a lot of um, people was recruited from the South to be in the schools to balance the racial problems with the black children that didn't have people look like them. And over the years, it's dwindled, and people have just been gradually, gradually, gradually retired, passed away, and dismissed. But during those days, no principal was left, let go without the community knowing what was going on. Because back in the 70s, we had a central school council that observed and monitored the district to make sure that things was equally balanced as much as could possibly be. Now, the problem that Leshy didn't start, they didn't start yesterday. They've been going on for years, and in all the schools, they've been going on for years. Black people have been treated different from white people, and that is very disturbing. It's more disturbing at a time when we're going through COVID-19, 
when people are having so much trouble and stresses in their homes, children are stressed because they are so limited. And this is a very, very difficult time for them to have the changes at school. The world is changing. And I have faith in all of you that's volunteering. I know that you knew. I've been before the school board many times. None of you I've ever met. I've heard good things about the superintendent from one of my students from Garfield. But I just know that this this has to be a mistake. So I'm pleading to you to re-evaluate what you're doing. Ms. Molan care about the children. She's a hard worker. She lives in the community. And and I'm hearing from the parents that they are pleased. So I'm asking you you to re-evaluate the situation. I'm sorry Mr. Floyd had to die for white people to find out that black people are tired of being misused. And and I'm sad about all of that. So please know that I come to you very sad today about the situation. Thank you for listening. Next up for public testimony is Kristen Tuttle. That's Kristen Tuttle. And um, Tina, if you could um, work to put the timer back on our screen for our next speaker. Hi, my name is Kristen Tuttle, and I was actually planning to also yield my time to Alma Horton if she'd like to continue. Were you able to hear me? We can hear you. We, we don't. We, I don't have Alma here. I, I can't see her. you'd like to finish your time uh sure i'll just then i'll just say that we demand transparency and accountability for the abrupt removal of principal Miland. um and i'm like several families here i think that i'm uh, somewhat new to the community you've just been here two years um and it meant a lot to me to be in this diverse neighborhood and to have um not only a you know diverse school but um, diverse leadership and uh, lots of people of color and black people on staff and staff and teach my kids. And I just um, echo everyone else's statements that um, that we're seeing evidence of structural racism and a lack of accountability in the school. And given the policies that have been created here so thoughtfully, I'm really disappointed to see that. Um, so thank you very much. Next up for public testimony is um, Chetty McAfee. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chetty McAfee and I'm with CAY, otherwise known as Central Area Youth Association. We've been in the community for over 55 years and counting. We too demand transparency and accountability for the abrupt removal of Principal Maland. I'm going to read from the certified letter that we sent out on June 12th and it reads as follows. As partners of uh, SPS, we have a commitment and obligation to the BSK program, and this removal of Ms. Milland is problematic. Our work and the programs we have developed are currently being used within Leshi Elementary. This work is being performed by three organizations, PERS, the Joseph Project, and CAY. Having said that, we were concerned and it came as a, as a surprise when we were informed that Lisa Milland was removed from her position as principal of Leshi Elementary. Even more surprising is when and how this decision was executed. We consider it a great loss and a disruption to the significant progress we have made under her tenure. It is during uh, Ms. Milland's tenure that we had the most productive year. Although it was only six months or so, we made progress within that time frame. that the entirety, then the entirety of the previous year. We had a true opportunity without roadblocks to develop relationships with the teachers and an effort to work together on the behalf of the young scholars and their families. They are our community and the reason for our partnership. Ms. Molaz's removal as principal of Leshi is an affirmation that something is broken within the governance of SPS and it needs to be identified and addressed so that the outcome is a reflection of what is best for our community. This action is also disruptive. As I mentioned earlier, we need to understand your, commit- your commitment to your own policy, 0030 and our community and its needs. How does this decision of Mrs. Molan's removal promote a safe and welcoming environment according to your policy? Black principles matter. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next up for public testimony is David Posner. David, if you have joined by phone, can you press star six to unmute? I'm not hearing from David. Um, next up for from public testimony is Robin N. Thompson. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Um, Robin N. Thompson, I am a parent at Lesh Elementary. I demand transparency and accountability for the abrupt removal of Principal Molan. And I do believe this is structural racism, how she was removed, and pretty overt. And like Mr. Donaldson said, you really need to consider the kids here and what effect this has on them. So in your own policy 0300, it says to ensure the promotion of racial equity. Remember that word equity. And C, shall recruit, employ, and support and retain a workforce that includes racial, gender, and linguistic diversity, supporting personnel with instructional and uh, supervisional support. This basically didn't happen. You're not really even um, adhering to your own policy. And it was, like I said, pretty overt. It says you should provide professional development to strengthen and retain. So I also see here, it says you are, as superintendent is authorized to develop procedures to implement this, pro this policy, including an action plan with clear accountability and metrics. Now, if we're talking about equity, I think we all know and agree that black women are oppressed more often than even other people of color, even men. So in order to achieve equity, this action plan would need to, it says it is authorized, to include an action plan based on equity, meaning we would need to give, the district would need to give her more support, not the same support, not really bad support from Mr. Ruby, more support, okay? So I'm curious to see this action plan and I would like to see the action plan and see it changed and have it be actually equitable. Um, next up for public testimony, um, looks like we've already gone to Gerald Donaldson. So next up would be Ty Velasquez. Hi, am I not able to yield my time to Mr. Donaldson? No. If so, I'm a flesh shy parent. I'd like to yield my time to Mr. Donaldson, please. Ms. Wilson Jones, I think that's permitted, correct? Um, um, generally, we, each person would have one speaking opportunity during the meeting. Um, Ger uh, General Donaldson was next on our list, um, however, so I, I would defer to you on how to administer for today. If folks would like to yield to whomever, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Thank you. I'm yielding to Mr. Donaldson, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon again. Um, as, as my fellow Lesherites mentioned, it is a hard time for us in this time of uh, COVID and racial unrest. Um, relationships are important in education, particularly in communities of color. Relationships take time to develop and are built on trust and communication. Building trusting relationships with students, families, and staff in order to achieve goals that for our, our district are core for our current strategic plan, changing the entire admin team within a year of difficult, difficult for family, staff, and community partners, especially during a crisis such as COVID-19. Um, knowing Ms. Moland this year and last year when she was the vice principal, she brought a lot of great things into our building. We, like uh, Ms. Chetty said, we have a lot of community partners, but this breaks to me of systemic racism because we again have a black principal who was removed from our building, no, no input from the last from the community, our families, our students. And, and if you have a black principal in our building, our children look up to her, they see themselves. We have future educators, future principals, future superintendents, future board member presidents within our building. And if they continue to see our people of color removed for no apparent reason, and 
how they are treated by when we send letters downtown, we don't get a response. Mr. Ruby has been rude and Eric been disrespectful to us numerous times. And uh, we just, at one part we demand is that he is not our air director anymore for his treatment, how he treated Ms. Mullen and other staff members. And that's uh, that, that really needs to be done. Um, and remember folks, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about the children. And due to the smell of systemic racism that we continue to have in Seattle Public Schools, I cannot breathe. I cannot breathe with this anymore. Black Lives Matter. Let's get to, let's stick to our policy and do what our policy said we're going to do and treat Black folks with respect that we demand and deserve. Thank you, Gerald. Next up for public testimony is Dana Barnett. Dana Barnett, if you have joined by phone, if you could press star six to unmute. Ms. Ms. Wilson Jones, I think we, we skipped Ty and Natalie. Um, Ty ceded to Gerald Donaldson, and um, ne unless you were um, hoping to call those two separately, and Natalie Wassany had time ceded to her earlier. Understood. Thank you. Just, just to check the team. Um, so next up would be Dana Barnett. Uh, I believe Ms. Barnett had to go um, for a work call, was willing to cede her time to Ms. Velasquez or to Mr. Donaldson. Okay, so next on the public testimony list would be James Lucid um, Gearman. James, are you there? If you could press I star am. six to unmute. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I am. And, and um, to the same end as as uh, um, the earlier group, I, I do demand uh, transparency and accountability uh, to the abrupt removal of Ms. Milan from Lesh Elementary and would like to cede my time again to Gerald Donaldson. Can I give my time to Ms. Velasquez, please? The remaining please. time so we can hear it, please. That's fine. Thank you. Good Go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ty Velasquez. I have a child that attends Leshi Elementary. I'm also a product of Seattle Public Schools attending West Woodland Elementary in Ballard, McClure Middle School on Queen Anne, and Franklin High School in South Seattle. Along with other Leshi parents and community members, we are here to demand transparency and accountability for the abrupt removal of Principal Moland. Ms. Moland was removed from her role as a first-year principal in the middle of a pandemic. A Black woman, deeply rooted in the community she was hired to serve, was removed after less than one year in the position. What supports was she given? Why was she removed? Have other first-year principals been treated this way? Why was the Leshi community informed of her removal via an email from the superintendent announcing the appointment of a new principal without even acknowledging Ms. Moland's service? This is Seattle Public Schools perpetuating institutional racism. We have been told by several people at SPS that it is within the purview of the superintendent to remove and appoint principals. Isn't that a fundamentally flawed approach? A district that has an entire department related to family and community partnerships, yet fails to see the critical nature of including families and community in decisions about a school principal? That approach seems asinine. Seattle Public Schools is in violation of policy number 0030. It is imperative that the messaging and action from SPS around equity are in both alignment and integrity. The messaging is aligned, the action is not. Therefore, SPS is out of integrity. You have broken what little trust existed and damaged relationships with a school community without specific action to demonstrate a commitment to transparency and accountability. You are complicit in upholding and contributing to institutional racism. We are watching you. Thank you. Next up for public testimony is Lori, sorry, Laura Fuji. Hello, um, I am both a Leshi Elementary School parent and an educator within the Bellevue School District. Um, I uh, want to agree with all that's been said before me regarding the abrupt removal of our principal, Ms. Maland. We demand accountability. We demand an explanation. We demand transparency. I wanted to share that as an educator at a separate elementary school, my own principal reached out to Ms. Maland because of the equity efforts that were happening at Leshi Elementary. 
a role model for another district has been removed with no explanation. I would like to cede the rest of my time to Ms. Velasquez if she has anything else she wants to say. Ty, you're muted. Ty, you're muted. Thank you. I would just like to say that we, I agree with um, Mr. Donaldson that we as a Leshi community do not feel comfortable with Anthony Ruby as a supervisor for Leshi due to his poor treatment of both Ms. Moland and other adults within the Leshi community. Thank you, I'm done. Next up for public testimony is Aggie Brown. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can, thank you. Hey, last I parent, I am a multiracial BIPOC identified woman with a multiracial child. And we demand transparency and accountability, accountability for the abrupt removal of Prince Wilma Land. <clears throat> I wanna share that I specifically targeted and chose this school for my child. And it means so much that she is seeing diverse faces specifically proud, smart, kind, loving. And I am extremely disappointed and infuriated about how Ms. Milan was <clears throat> treated. And I echo Mr. Donaldson, Velasquez, and my other fellow and <clears throat> demand transparency about what is going on. With no word at all being shared, what how can we do but decide and see that this is systemic racism? Anything that makes any sense coming from any of you. And <clears throat> if there's any last words um, from a less I parent, I would like to see, because to be honest with you, I'm so heated right now, I could barely breathe in. I stand with our community and demand justice. See and demand, I thank you. Thank you. Next up for public testimony is Carrie Goldenberg. Hi, hold on, I have to get my notes. Hi, my name is Carrie Goldenberg. I'm a mom of an incoming fifth grader and a second grader at Leshi Elementary. I wanted to express my disappointment in the institutional racism perpetuated at the organizational level at Seattle Public Schools. The removal of Lisa Milland was strikingly different from the experience we had last year when we were fam a family at the Gatsert School. The principal there was problematic and um, she was scaffolded by the district. There was on-site and visible mentorship that included both staff and community partners. Restorative circles were encouraged by the district and the district stood behind this white principal throughout her departure her voluntary departure. None of this happened with the removal of Ms. Milland, a black woman. There was no opportunity to listen to parent or the Leshi community and specifically the black community for feedback. This dismissal was abrupt and did not include any stakeholders. Removing a black woman principal in her first year position without equitable mentorship is upholding institutional racism. I'm disappointed in the lack of metric used in this administrative choice. We demand transparency and accountability for her abrupt removal. I'll yield my time to Mr. Donaldson if he has anything else to say. Uh, thank you, that was well put. And as everyone says, we continue to have these same conversations over and over and over, yet nothing is being done. And if we expect our children to grow, which we know they can, and they see black people, women, particularly moved. How can we grow as a community? It's blatant, it's obviously there's some racism in there. We have to stop it right now. We need to stop it, especially look at this time we're going through right now. We're moving a black person, but not only a, a pandemic, but a racial pandemic that's been going on for over 400 years. It needs to stop. Thank you. Next for public testimony is Eric Johnson.
Eric Johnson. Hello. Oh, we Hello. can hear can you. you hear Thank you. Yes, we can That's hear you. Great. Thank you. I just want to echo what the other parents uh, have said um, recently. Um, we are demanding transparency and accountability for the abrupt removal of our principal in the land. Um, I'm the parent of a recent graduate, fifth grade rad graduate from uh, Leshai Elementary and an incoming second grader at Leshai. I am the product of uh, Seattle Public Schools, having attended T.T. Minor Elementary School, Washington Middle School, and Garfield High School. Um, we moved back to Seattle. Uh, we moved here to the Central District where I had grown up uh, and wanted to uh, for, and wanted to attend Leshai for all the reasons that others have echoed um, as spoken about. And uh, the, the way that the events of this past year have unfolded um, leading to the dismissal or the removal of Principal Milland under the situation that uh, under the, the, the lack of transparency uh, situation has, has left all of us uh, as a community and as a school and as parents and as, as um, teachers and staff and then ultimately as students uh, feeling as uh, as if uh, we've been left out of any conversation or any uh, oversight, and um, particularly in a time when there's a lack of communication that's been happening in terms of in-person contact during the pandem pandemic, and then leading up to uh, the last two months and what's been unfolding uh, in, in terms of the, the protest movements and the, uh, the drive towards addressing systemic and institutional racism. And I just want to echo what others have said, uh, in particular what Mr. Donaldson said and what Ms. Velasquez have said. Um, we feel that the, the district uh, needs to do a better job and needs to listen to um, and communicate. Uh, and I want to put the, that word communicate up front and center because this is a time when we need to uh, have heightened states of communication between the district and between teachers and staff and us parents. So I appreciate you uh, listening to, to us today. Thank you very much. Next for public testimony is jo Jessica Walker um, Beaum Beaumont. I believe uh, Ms. Horton still has, uh, has the ability to speak. Is that not correct? Um, uh, time was earlier ceded to her. So generally um, people would have one opportunity for public testimony under our rules. What happened to my time, Thelma Horton? I, I, I thought that the director had indicated he was willing to, to, uh, to let that um, pass for this particular meeting based on the, on the number of, of uh, passings. But I, said, wants to continue I had to something else that. I wanted. I had a suggestion for you that was very valuable. If folks want Can to I quickly give it to you? If, one moment, please. If folks want to cede their time to folks who've already chosen who've already spoken, that's what I was saying we could do today if folks wanted to cede their time to people who have already spoken, not that they will have their chance again. I just want one second. You need to cede your time. So Ms. Wilson-Jones, the next speaker, please. Um, the next speaker and the final speaker is Jessica Walker Beaumont. Did you tell me I can have one second? Not at this moment, just hold please. Is Jessica Walker Beaumont on the? You'll need to press star six to unmute if you joined by phone. Moving on, then the next speaker would be Nina Yu. Nina Yu, are you on the line? It looks like I can see Nina. Um, I believe I saw Nina had joined by Teams. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We can hear. Hello, my name is Nina Yu. I teach second grade. I am an educator of color. I'm a by byproduct of my parents' immigration. I'm here to testify and support with my colleagues to speak on normalizing and including race and racial justice into our schools and classrooms. Our black, indigenous, and other students of color need to be seen, heard, and supported. They need to be represented through black, indigenous, and other educators and admin of color. They, they need to be represented through the curriculum that we teach. Our teaching practices, the books that we read to them, and the books that we have available to them. As an educator of color, I need to know that I can lead a topic on race and justice with the support of my staff and district. As an educator of color, I need to know that I can support our families in continuing to talk about race and justice at home. As an educator of color, I need to know that there will be a budget allocated to finance these resources into our classrooms 
and homes, our students will not be able to recognize what it means to be a member of their community if we do not teach them and also practice basic human rights and humanity. Thank you. I would also like to concede the rest of my time to Elma Horton. Thank you, Elma. Please pause um, the timer. Elma, you'll need to press star six. Okay. My last solution, because I know I'm, a, I'm probably the oldest person in the room. I believe in all of the school board members that volunteer their time. I believe in the parents that their hearts are hurting. Can you hear me? Yes, can you can. hear me? Yes, we can. And and we are all hurting at this time with the COVID-19. So my suggestion is, it's clear that communication has not been clear. Transparency have not exist. It's very clear. And everybody in the world had made mistakes. So I'm just saying to my district, to the superintendent that's over our district, and to our staff, if you would go back, rethink, investigate, rework all of this, and give Miss Milan her school back with some help, like people got at other schools. I know several principals Thank was having you. trouble, and other principals was assigned to help them. And this didn't happen at last year's school. Now, we need to move on if to the next saying year. that you care and showing it is different, so that's my suggestion because we have to believe in each other and we have to support each other. Thank you. That was our 20th speaker for public testimony today. Thank you everyone. That concludes our public testimony for today's meeting. We will now move to the action item items on today's agenda. As we move through these items and later the introduction items, I will first call on committee chairs and then I'll call on the remaining directors alphabetically for questions and comments. So we will now move to action item number one, directing the superintendent to enter into negotiations for a student and community workforce agreement. May I have a motion for this item, please? Am I can am I unmuted? We can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, I move for the uh, sorry. I move that the school board authorize. This is Director Hampson. I move that the school board authorize the superintendent. I'm sorry. I'm not, I need to get to the right. That's okay, Director Hampson. We can pause. What number is it? Action number one. Oh, but it's okay. That's why. Sorry about that. I move that the school board direct the superintendent to enter into negotiations for an SCWA student community workforce agreement with the Seattle Building and Construction Trades Council, consistent with the recommendations of the task force that were presented to the school board on June 17th, 2020. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. I second the motion, Director Harris. Thank you. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. This item did not go through the committee and is on the agenda for introduction and action today. I will be briefing us shortly and then uh, call on directors uh, in alphabetical order before we move to the vote. Um, I just wanted to replay some of the background. This item is coming before us after uh the progress that we've made uh we were so excited last year about a year ago from today to create the student and community workforce agreement task force with the express uh charge of coming to bringing recommendations to the board that would help us require more uh, black brown poc women uh and and other folks onto our construction jobs uh, as part of our uh, capital side of the Seattle Public Schools. As you know, uh, the, this this bar is legislation that follows two years of, of work, and obviously we're really grateful for the, the work of the community 
Student and Community Workforce Agreement Task Force. One of the really exciting things about community workforce agreements is that they promote access to construction for careers for community members, women, people of color, veterans, and other folks with social and economic disadvantages. DWAs are also intended to establish a spirit of harmony and stability between labor and management to ensure timely completion of projects. We expressed a lot of this in the charter for the task force following the intent of the school board for SCWA to advance social equity, increase workforce diversity, create family wage opportunities to construction careers, and support the district's goals for career and technical education. Today, we are one step closer to accomplishing that goal. I'm also very proud of the task force that was very diverse and the recommendations almost were almost 100% adopted unanimously. We had we have heard a substantive and excellent presentation by the district's consultant, Ms. Nancy Locke, and task force members on June 17th. And I thank all of my board directors for joining me on that special day. This uh, piece, this bar is an important piece of achieving our racial equity goals, alignment with our strategic plan, and is part of our commitment to uh, our 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 community and making sure that we are putting our public tax dollars back into our community. I just do want to thank, before I move on to questions and comments from directors, I want to thank Chief of Operations, uh, Fred Podesta, Nancy Locke, and all of the task force members and the representatives uh, of our labor partners, as well as representatives from the construction industry and also our career and technical education team here at Seattle Public Schools for their hard work and bold leadership towards the passage of those recommendations for the Student and Community Workforce Agreement. The bar before us uh, and, and the, sale, the student and community workforce agreement, once we consider that, will help provide pathways out of poverty through economic opportunity in the construction industry. I'm really excited about this. I hope uh, other directors are. And now I will open it up to directors in alphabetical order, uh, starting with Director Hampson. I don't have any questions today. We've had some fantastic uh, opportunities to discuss this at length, and I've appre sincerely appreciated all of the work that has gone into this uh, on behalf of yourself and the um, the task force and all of the individuals that um, have have put their time and energy behind this. I think it's a uh, it's a proud moment uh, for the district, and I look forward to seeing it operationalized in the in the years to come. So, very much support, and thank you for all of this. Thank you, Director Harris. Thousand percent behind us. It took too long, but could not be more pleased that I believe this will pass, and I can't wait to hear a year from now how much progress we have made getting our students trained in the family wage job and special shout out to uh, the task force members Monty Anderson and to Dale Bright and way to go President DeWolf nicely done. I appreciate you Director Harris and, and I've been grateful for your support throughout over the last couple of years. Um, Director Hersey. None for me let's get this done. Thank you Director Mack. Yes, hi, thank you. I'm very supportive and grateful for all of the work uh, on this, um, not the least of which is starting with uh, the title being student, um, that, you know, as we are an educational institution, uh, ensuring that we are focusing on students in this um, uh, work is so critical, and I'm really grateful that that is there and that this is uh, moving forward. Um, I was just trying to open the, the bar, and it took uh, the full time you were talking, President DeWolf, to actually get it to open because it's such a large um, document. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, what I was looking for and I found was that the fiscal impact, um, that the negotiations of uh, this agreement, so having the superintendent start the work of doing the negotiation doesn't expect to have an impact, but that uh, potentially when the actual agreement comes before us, there may be some impact at that time and we would learn about that. So that was the yeah. question I was trying to um, ask and I answered it myself by finding it in the document. Um, <laughs> so I don't actually have any direct questions at this time, but um, thank you and I'll cede my time to the next director. Thank you, Director Mack. Director Rankin? No, I just will echo the comments that came before me and um, and say thank you to everyone for the hard work on this. It's really exciting. Thank you. Director Rivetta Smith. 
Likewise, just um, enormous thanks to all that were involved. I know this has been a um, process that's been going on for a while now and just excited that we're going to be able to offer this to our students and our community. And um, no other questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Director Nevada President Wolf? Director Harris, yes. Uh, I think we also need a shout out to former board member Rick Burke on this one. Yes. He helped lift. Thank you. Yes, thank you to former Director Burke. Uh, was really was really crucial in, in making sure we can get this task force put together. So I thank the, the former executive committee of Director Harrison, Director Burke for that. The only final thing I'll say is I think this continues to be in line with our recent uh, resolution number 2019-20-38, uh, which is our uh, affirming our commitment to our black students. But I think overall, this is, an, this is a racial justice an economic justice initiative, and I'm so grateful that the Seattle Public Schools will be a part of this historic moment. Um, and with that, Ms. Wilson-Jones, uh, roll call, please. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director DeWolf. Absolutely, yes. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank Yay. you, sir. We will now move to action item number two. Amending board policy number 1430, audience participation, and board procedure number 1430BP, audience participation. This came to the executive committee on June 10th for consideration. May I have a motion for this item, please? This is Director Hampson. I move that the school board amend policy number 1430, audience participation, and board procedure 1430 BP audience participation as attached to the board action report. Second the motion, Director Harris. Thank you. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. This item has been updated since introduction. So Chief Legal Counsel Greg Narver, could you please brief us on that update? Yes, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this bar came to the board for introduction two weeks ago and there were some uh, changes made to the wording of Board Procedure 1430 BP that you would be approving today. Uh, specifically, there were three places where the Board Procedure used the phrase he or she to refer to the speaker. Uh, these have been changed in one instance to, quote, the speaker, and in two instances to they. Uh, those are the only changes that were made to uh, anything in this packet since introduction. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move to directors for any, any comments or questions we uh, have before the vote. Uh, I'll start just as executive committee chair and we'll move alphabetically. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, this has been uh, a lot of work and I appreciate Chief Counsel Greg Narver uh, and I know the work of our former uh, board and former executive committee have focused on this. So I'm, I'm excited to see this come through to um, really uh, tighten up and clean up this policy. And I would look forward to bringing this back if uh, directors have continued ideas to make this even stronger. So um, Director Hampson, I will turn it over to you. Thank you and um, thank you, um, uh, Chief Legal Counsel Narver for your uh, work on this. I know it was a, a huge point of, of commitment for you and uh, I, I appreciate it immensely because I do believe that this is an area where um, it, it, it is actually a pretty major part of our community engagement and it's been a frustration for, for many for some time. And I know within the constraints of what we're allowed to do per our state um, laws, uh, that it's not everything that we that we would like it to be, um, but it's a great start towards making some, some pretty uh, major improvements. And I hope it will um, continue to be, you know, a living document that, that uh, we can adjust as time goes on as we have more flexibility uh, to engage our community, engage with our community around the issues that we consider in the most productive way possible. So my gratitude and support for the um, for the bar. 
Thank you. Thank you, Director Hampson. Director Harris. Very pleased to see this come before us. Other issues that I hope we discuss within the near are um, setting aside some time to speak about things like policy 0030, white supremacy, moving the board meeting back to later times so that parents and community can get there, and increasing the time limit. But in any event, I think thanks certainly are due to Chief Counsel Narver, much appreciated, but also to our board administrator, uh, Ms. Ellie Wilson-Jones. Thank you so very much. I uh, will not feel like a fraud anymore with respect to the First Amendment. Thank you, Director Harris. Uh, you, you have really strong advocacy around that. I'm really grateful we could make this even stronger. Director Hersey. Sorry, I was on mute. <clears throat> um, I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Uh, yes, thank you. Actually, I, I do. A question came up for me because of today's experience that we had with the um, a number of instances where uh, uh, the mem the people that were testifying uh, decided to cede their time and the difficulty with unmuting and and all of that. And I'm curious to know, is that actually written, is that practice of seating time written into the board procedure or is that, is that actually defined somewhere else? I didn't find it as I was looking through. And I'm wondering if that is, if I'm wondering if that's something that needs um, clarity and support so that we can ensure that voices are heard. Uh, Director Mack, it is in the board procedure. Um, about uh, seeding time, everyone was using the word yield. And so if you did a, a search for yield, you wouldn't find anything, but uh, uh, it does talk about the uh, people uh, being permitted to seed their time. Uh, and it provides in this instance, the total amount of time allowed shall not exceed two minutes for the combined number of speakers. You don't get to restart the clock if you seed your time. There is a provision and this is discretionary. It's not driven by a legal constraint. It's it's. Uh, how the board president chooses to uh, uh, supervise the, the public comment. But the next provision of the board policy says, in order to maximize opportunities for others to address the board, each speaker is allowed only one speaking slot per meeting. Today, there were people wanting to cede repeatedly to the same speaker. You would have the discretion to say under our, our procedure, um, let's maximize the number of speakers and not hear just from one. But again, that's not a that's not a legal constraint. It's something that uh, the uh, president could uh, could restrict if uh, if chosen to. But it, it, to answer your question, yes, it is. It is in the board policy. OK, well, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, the challenges that we have with doing all of these meetings remotely and muting and finding documents, et cetera, it's just it, it's even more challenging. And I know that uh, we'll get better as time goes on. So uh, I, I just uh, want to acknowledge that and appreciate all of the uh, testimony that came out today. Um, thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Director Rankin. Um, no, I appreciate the clarification around the time being yielded, because uh, that was something that I was wondering, just given experience actually testifying in other, other, other meetings about the two minutes. So um, thank you for that, and no further questions. Thank you. Finally, Director Devetta Smith. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just want to start by my appreciation to Chief Narver for all his work on this and uh, for the edits regarding the he or she references um, that I re referenced um, in the last meeting about this. And so I appreciate those being adjusted. I, I'm questioning, so it's something I mentioned in my email to the board after that meeting about this was also about in what is it, section six of the procedure um e 6e about how the board president can request the assistance of district security or law enforcement in the removal of a disorderly person who has previously been asked to leave and refuse that request um i still question whether or not we should strike law enforcement from that as we have been in talking so much about um how much we want to move away from bringing the police into matters as uh, just as we speak about racial justice and equity and how, I mean, we got them out of our schools already and I get that, it's, but this is not quite our school. I know this is, 
headquarters, and these are um, more, for the most part, adult meetings, but we do have students at them. And I just, I just question that. I, I, I don't know if I should have that conversation here. Um, I definitely love to hear that some of the other board members or Chief Narver um, feel about that one. Um, two comments. One, it, it's, you know, I think most things would be handled with if there's disorder at the meeting through district security. It really depends on the level of, of what's taking place. If something more serious were taking place, to have the option to call law enforcement might be something the board would want. The other point I'll make is that I think we're contemplating a work session in August where a variety of uh, policies are going to be, I'm sorry, am I echoing? Uh, a variety of policies are going to be under review uh, with the common theme of uh, security and just what, what the role is going to be of security officers, law enforcement, things like that. That would be a time also to maybe uh, bring this up. Um, at this point, it's only in there as an option. It's not any the presence of law enforcement isn't required. The board president doesn't have any obligation to call on law enforcement, but it it is there as an option if uh, if something actually rose to the level of that being uh, necessary. But it would all be within the discretion of the board president presiding over the meeting. Does that answer for you, Director Nevada Smith? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry. I appreciate that. Now I was I was talking to myself there with mute on. Um, no, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I I feel like calling law enforcement is always an option. Um, the difference is that we're kind of enshrining it here. Um, that we do have. We want to make it clear we have that option. I don't know. Again, I'm not going to fight this too much. I just I do see kind of a disconnect between other conversations we're having regarding law enforcement in this. Um, again, I welcome any other board members who are have any say have any opinion on that but um i've said my piece thank you thank you director devetta smith do you want to make an amendment now at this time or would you be okay coming back in august at that work session and discussing this more I don't know, like I said, I guess, <laughs> yeah, why don't I? I'll make an amendment for it. Just I feel like it's consistent with where we're going and what we're talking about. Um, if it doesn't hurt anything, sure, I will make that amendment to strike the law enforcement from um, for, for procedure number 6E. I, I guess you'd have to clarify what you're, what you're wanting to propose. Yeah, okay, so so from the let me get this name here. Board procedure 1430 in page two, section actually this is six three that point number six, section E. I propose initially remove the words law enforcement from that. Greg, does that satisfy the correct wording? Yes, I, th I think actually the, the words you want to strike include or, or law enforcement. Right. Uh, so so th that it would read, 6E would now read, request the assistance of district security in the removal of a disorderly person who has previously been asked to leave and refused the request. So three words would be stricken, or law enforcement. So do I have a second? I'll second. This is Director Mack. Okay, directors, would you like uh, any conversation about this, Director Hampson? Um, somebody needs to go on mute. Um, I'm not sure. I guess I feel unprepared to speak to this right this moment because we have had some. Um, uh, security concerns in the past um, and, and theoretically I agree with the amendment but um, I, I think part of the rationale for doing it as part of the work session is to look at the broader context um, and I mean I don't I don't think it hurts to take it out as being written explicitly 
Um, it's just, as you said, director of our Smith, it's about what expectation it sets. And for the most part, we're talking about adults. And we've had adults um, that have had some really, uh, in, in this environment in particular, have had some really racist and um, uh, threatening behavior. Um, and because we're primarily speaking about adults, I guess I figure I, I feel like it's a it's a slightly different um, discussion, and and don't feel prepared to have it today. But I'm I'm not um, vociferously against the amendment. Theoretically, it makes sense. So that's all I have for the discussion. Thank you, Director Harris. Um, I have been in board meetings in the past where there have been attacks on board members where the police were in fact necessary to keep order. Now we haven't seen that kind of behavior and we were able to lessen the number of security personnel that we were paying overtime to in the last three years with the concept that if it was ugly, we call the police and or have them standing by. And I recall very significantly Deputy Nielsen and then Assistant Superintendent uh, Peggy McAvoy weighing in on that as well. Um, our safety and the folks of the safety that we bring in, I don't want to preclude calling the police. Like I say, it has been a very long time since we've had that kind of behavior, but it has been there. And it's troubling to me that that we're doing an amendment. I'd like to uh, table that until after the work session, frankly. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Director Hersey. Hmm. I don't think I have anything to add at this point. Thank you. Director Mack. Um, I, uh, I don't, I, I can't decide if, if it's a definite yes or a definite no. Actually, I'm still debating it in my head uh, because having it explicitly laid out does provide uh, support for if there was an extreme situation, which there has been in the past. So um, on the other hand, I'm not sure it needs to be um, stated. Um, I seconded it out of courtesy to have the conversation and uh, it may be most useful to have uh, this conversation in the context of um, the safety and security of uh, conversation and the policies that are being uh, reviewed. Um, so I'm not sure how I'll vote yet, but uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Director Rankin. Yeah, I'm having similar thoughts. I don't know. Uh, I, I understand the... Um, I understand the impulse to, to see law enforcement written there and, and want to remove it just based on uh, the other work that we're doing. But at the same time, this is a really different context than what we're looking at with other work. Um, the other work that we're looking at is an over-reliance on police and policing of students to um, as a behavior intervention and as a school management uh, uh, tool in, 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 in inappropriate and overly used ways. And we, we don't have that um, regarding this. And as Director Harris said, you know, I can imagine a situation where there would be an emergency that is, that is where, you know, law enforcement of some kind, it becomes the only necessary response. Like uh, we haven't faced that. So I guess my, my question would be if, uh, if removing it would be would mean that that is not an option, which seems weird. Um, uh, or if we could just change change it to uh, you know make appropriate appropriate response to support or I'm not contact appropriate authorities. I don't even know how to how to phrase it. But if the if the objection is specifically the words law enforcement, maybe we could just say it a different way, but um, I agree with Director Harris and Director Mack that, um, you know, there's the potential for a, a need, um, as rare as it as it might be. Understood. Thank you. Director Yvette Smith, any final comments? 
Yeah, um, no, thank you. I, I, you know, I'm happy that we began this conversation. Um, and I, I, I think, um, as I said earlier, I don't think anything ever precludes us from calling law enforcement for any reason. Um, nothing we write can stop that. We don't, we don't need explicit right to do that. That's always a right for anybody, anywhere. Um, so I feel like having it in here, you know, I mean, again, I'm trying to be consistent with what our, with what our uh, goals are and our, um, our, our talk on other, on law enforcement in general. And, um, it, because it's there, you know, it, it just makes a kind of a looming kind of foreboding feeling of this towards our speakers, um, that, you know, we're making sure we say it very explicitly. Um, but I, I there or not, we can still do it. So I don't know that that's enough of a reason. This is clearly just a judgment on how our board wants to present itself to potential speakers when we're inviting them in to take part. So um, I will rest on that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Davida Smith. Uh, my my only concern here is just the the not having enough time to sit with it or or um, be able to bring it up at our work session in August to to really um, kind of examine. Uh, that placement there. So um, um, with that, I will ask Ms. Wilson-Jones to do roll call on the amendment. Director Hampson? Nay. Director Harris? No. Director Hersey? Nay. Director Mack? Sorry, um, aye. Director Rankin? Nay. Director Rivera-Smith? Aye. Director DeWolf? Nay. This motion has not passed by a vote of two yes to five no. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll move to the vote on the underlying motion. Ms. Wilson-Jones, will you do roll call again, please? Yes, just a second. Um, Director Rankin? Oh, aye. Director Rivera-Smith? Aye. Director Hampson? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. Director Hersey? Aye. Director Mack? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. And thank you for that rich discussion, directors. Next, we will move to <clears throat> item number three, action item number three, which is resolution 201. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. Um, would directors like to take a 10 minute recess right now. I know we've been on for about two hours. Would you? Yes. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Okay, yes. so we're we're gonna actually recess for 10 minutes uh, until 3.08 p.m. Thank you.
Okay. This is Director DeWolf bringing the meeting back to order at 3.08 p.m. We will now move to action item number three. Resolution 2019-20-37, fixing and adopting the 2020 through 2021 budget. This came to the Audit and Finance Committee on June 8th for approval. May I have a motion for this item, please? This is Director Hampson. I move that the school board adopt resolution 2019-20 to 37 as attached to the board action report to fix and adopt the 2020 to 2021 budget, the four-year budget plan summary, and the four-year enrollment projections. Do I have a second? I'd be happy to second that. Thank you, Director DeWolf. Okay, so this item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director DeWolf. We'll now move to directors for any comments or questions uh, for Chief Financial Officer Joe Lynn Berge before we vote. Uh, but actually, uh, Chief Berge, I'm wondering if you could just provide some background again and uh, just about the process for listeners on the phone, um, kind of what the process looks like over the course of 12 months um, before we move to directors. Sure. Um, we start in the fall. We kind of, um, in the fall, we go over um, basic information, other information about the budget, where we're going, what it looks like as far as um, what's known about the upcoming school year. So we start that in the fall for the following school year's development. So we started working on this budget really last September and we meet just about monthly um, to start talking about the process um, and what's going to be recommended. So there's often um, items that the board members might want to see more information on. This brings forward staff recommendations that we develop with um, our internal um, way to staffing standards process. And we bring that forward generally around December. Uh, the board will look at it and we, if the board wants to move forward, we move forward. Staffing rolls out based on those um, tentative numbers then in February. We continue to refine the other parts of the budget that are more discretionary as far as other dollars that are available to be spent that are outside of maybe collective bargaining agreements and staffing at that point. Um, and we continue to work those issues all the way up really through May. Um, and then we come to the budget hearing in July. This typically Seattle has run the budget hearing at the same time um, as the um, action item on the board agenda. Thank you. So Director Hampson, as the Audit and Finance Committee Chair, I'll turn it over to you first for any uh, questions or comments for Chief Berge and the budget. Um, yes, thank you. I, I, I want to acknowledge, oh, we've had a, a, a flurry of emails um, around um, asking for some uh, transparency around some particular budget items, which I, um, uh, we were able to provide back to community um, around our security guard. So I do want to um, uh, address that we we have gotten some some detail um, that those increases uh, only a very very small portion um, something around 100 and I think 27,000 has to do with um, uh, additional um, security guards these that we're currently in collective bargaining with our um, security um, our 609 um, union that um, represents our our security um, staff uh, the 73 percent of whom are, are staff of color and 24 percent of whom are are black. And um, the questions had to do with whether or not we were ramping up our security because there was a budget increase. And so I just want to um, make sure that um, for the benefit of those listening that um, we were able to get that additional information back out to community to satisfy that information. The vast majority of it actually is for um, bus monitors that um, provides uh, support for uh, students um, with special um, education uh, services. Um, and there's some other detail that um, if, if uh, 
uh, Chief Berge wants to add on, um, please feel free. Um, I, I know that it's a difficult time to, to fathom approving um, a, a massive budget. Uh, it, it is uh, frequently the case um, that the, as a district, we look at, at um, school districts um, over time, they experience tremendous amounts of volatility. Um, and the, the like any entity, when we do budget approval, we have to do it with the best information that we have. And um, we are in a very fluid situation. There's no question about it. Um, and I think that the the title um, um, is a little bit misleading. It's not inaccurate when we say fixing. Um, the the budget is fixed. It is what the budget represents is our best projection of where we think we're going to be uh, in the in this next fiscal year. Um, so I think that that's sort of um, uh, where people can get a little bit caught up on it. And we've had a number of sessions about it and really grappled with how we prioritize as a board um, some really competing needs. We had some great community feedback even in our sessions engagement around um, reopening of schools. Are we prioritizing health and safety or are we prioritizing education? And that is something that we continue to grapple with as our, as our society doesn't necessarily meet the needs of our families and our students with respect to um, other supports, uh, uh, other social supports and safety nets, that much of that often falls to our school systems, um, even in, as much as we are, our, our primary purpose is the provision of education. And so in looking at the budget for next year, I know that um, even beliefs that that I had, you know, two months ago about what should be prioritized um, feels like it might look different, you know, a month from now as things evolve in our economy and in our um, in our state with respect to the coronavirus. Um, so I, I appreciate all the, the work that has gone into this and the desire to provide additional information. I do want to say that I have asked for um, that as we go into next year, we have some of the same detail around uh, uh, departmental budgets that was in the prior year budget, um, and Chief Berge has committed to getting that to us um, for August so that we have that detail and that it's available publicly. Um, the uh, the generation of this um, budget was done during a particularly um, intense time, which was the transition of our school system, the pivot to 100% online in, in March. Um, so, uh, but but I do think we need to remain committed to that transparency, and I'm always happy to work with uh, Chief Berge and make sure that that gets out to to community. So, um, I do believe that uh, in terms of where we are, um, this is where we have landed in terms of priority of you know curriculum versus versus other pieces. Um, and I look forward to hearing what other directors. Um, uh, have to say about how they're feeling about it, but I think it's really important that we're able to to settle on um, on a budget and move forward um, so that we can can keep moving ahead. And then um, we'll need as a as a board to pay very close attention, work very closely with staff to make adjustments as they um, as they will surely arise for us with um, funding and expense um, shifts that will occur because of coronavirus. Um, so I'll. Um, Pass it on then to the next director. Thank you, Director Ham. Director Harris. Um, first of all, big props to our staff and particularly to Chief Bergie. She answers questions when asked. She is candid. Uh, don't always agree, but hugely appreciate the candidness. Uh, my concerns are several and most of them have to do with COVID-19 and our enrollment projections and what the additional cost for COVID-19 will be and whatever cuts will come from the legislature because I do believe they will cut us. Um, I'm wondering whether or not we can roll this forward when we have a better idea of what our um, enrollment projections are in our student revenue because each child comes with a substantial amount of money and when hopefully our impact bargaining is more clear 
the other concerns that I have that I've stated before and nothing if not consistent, the weighted staffing standards, WSS, is not in policy. It's a practice. It's not as transparent as some of us would like to see and hear a fair amount of pushback from our school communities that make it hard to plan. And I'd like to see us in our efforts um, in transparency and with the valued leadership of Chair of ANS Hampson, um, we, we address that as well. Uh, frankly, at this point in time, I uh, believe I'll be abstaining on the budget and for clarity and transparency purposes, I am embarrassed to admit that I did not appreciate we would not be voting on the operations budget and the capital budget at the same time. And thought, parliamentary legal uh, direction from Chief Counsel Narver who tells me that's not possible. I'm disappointed in, but that's the way it is. I'm done. Chief Berge, did you want to respond to any of those questions or concerns? Well, I would speak to rolling the budget forward. We won't know what any of the, we won't know what our enrollment is until we get to the second week of school. So the budget by law has to be passed um, by August. So we can't, we would not be know anything more. I, I do not believe we'll know anything more than what we know today. I think that our intent to enroll gave us good confidence that our the majority of our families want to come back to in-person instruction, not, not just to SPS, but in-person instruction. Um, and as far as what the legislature might do, they have um, now there doesn't look like there's going to be a special session. So that gives me hope that there's no mid-year cuts for 2021. And we will likely not know um, what the legislature might do until the very end of our next budget development cycle, likely in April or May. So from my, in my opinion, my professional opinion, rolling the budget forward, um, it, we're just not able to do it because of the legislative um, requirement and the RCW requirement in law. Thank you. Director Hersey. Hi, thank you for all the work that's gone into this. I just wanted to again touch on the advocacy that has been done um, by Wablock, the Seattle and Black and Brown Lives Matter. Um, really, thank you so much, JoLynn, for providing that context. It was greatly appreciated. And I just want to highlight the fact that um, our budget process for including community um, sometimes is very slow, especially during this moment of uh, where it's a challenge for us to be interconnected. And as we saw from our budget hearing earlier, I know it conflicted with um, one that was going on at the city, but we have one participant. So as we're moving forward and as we get more, especially student groups who are engaging with us in budget conversations, I wanna challenge us and charge us to think about how we are um, reinventing and reimagining our processes to make um, these opportunities for comment and advocacy uh, more accessible, especially to uh, the young folks in our community. So again, thank you for our work. Thank you to the advocacy for all of those who sent in emails. It is greatly appreciated. And uh, yeah, I will we'll rest and pass on. Thank, thank you, Director Hersey. Uh, and I, and I uh, obviously Director Hampson's on this call and she's the chair of ANF. So I think that many of these comments about ideas for next year are greatly appreciated. I know that it will be our first chance uh, as this board as us seven to engage in that in that conversation from the very beginning in the fall. So um, thank you for that idea. Uh, Director Mack. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, Director Hersey's um, request to improve the community engagement. Maybe we even need to move to some more participatory budgeting uh, type work. Um, and I, um, I'm rather concerned that we are not um, set up effectively for the current crisis and what it's going to actually do come the fall. And I, I, you know, I'm looking at the numbers. I'm trying to think about how you know these things pivot, 
we have a lot of unknowns. Um, and, you know, the budget development process started in February and the numbers we're working on are from February. And it, it causes me some concern that we will really be far off on, in terms of costs and that they're not actually, um, that the budget isn't really reflecting our needs um, for student safety um, and, um, you know, also how we have to pivot in our buildings specifically that the enrollment is gonna be very different if we have an A and B schedule the capacity of our buildings, the amount of uh, costs associated with that, the additional costs associated with the time for um, ensuring that students are healthy. Um, there's just a, there's a lot of unknowns, and I'm I'm really nervous about whether or not the budget actually reflects that. On page 15 of the budget book, it talks about the impacts of COVID, but it only talks about the revenue side, um, and so. Um, some big questions that come up for me is whether or not we are adequately budgeting for the needs in our buildings and in our with our schools and with our students and for remote learning. Um, and when I look at page eight, um, I'm, forgive me for being a little confused on this, but page eight is a summary of direct services and support services that's pulled out separate from the general fund information later on in the book. And when I look at these different numbers, I'm just kind of curious why they're broken out this way. For example, printed materials sent to student homes for remote learning. I don't, there's a $500,000 line item for that, but I don't, I don't recall that ever being in the budget before. So I'm wondering, is it, Jill, can you call out the places in the budget that have been modified for expenses in response to our current situation in COVID. What, where, where have we recognized that we actually are going to have additional costs and that we're going to put the dollars there? I, I think we heard about custodial services before. Um, uh, I, it, it just, this is if I can finish, if I can. Right, if I could just finish my question really quick. The custodial services is one uh, question right. mark I, I have. Gonna, I think about what the other, if the I could finish my question, session. Director Hampton, please. The other question I have is about um, training for uh, our safety and security personnel. I see training is called out for, uh, for school personnel and others, but I, I don't see it called out for our safety personnel. Um, and so I, I'm curious to know where in the budget it's been adjusted for, for COVID and these things that we knew we, we know we're going to need to spend money on. Ms. Bergie, do you mind seeing, I, I appreciate that I'm kind of putting you on the spot and I didn't pose this question prior. Nope, uh, I'm good. Your reference, Director Mack, this is um, information that was provided in some specific tables in our work session um, that we had asked from, so if you want to pull that up, that might be helpful in your comprehension of it, but go ahead, Chief Bergie. Yeah, so we've talked about it a couple different times. Um, at the last budget work session, we talked about really the areas of flexibility, and we had identified probably close to $15 million, or I'm sorry, probably closer to $25 million or so of choices that we could make. And the board um, wanted, had chosen to prioritize curriculum, so that's moving forward. But there were a few other places that the board was able, you know, we have set aside um, money for, but we don't really, um, we can use those as a place to flex. And that's what we talked about. So we talked about using the fall enrollment um, bucket of money. We talked about not increasing the economic stabilization fund as another way to flex if needed. So there were two or three places. There was the infrastructure dollars. We were flexing on those dollars as well as needed and reducing the amount that we were going to spend on infrastructure, setting aside the $500,000 that the board asked for for the HR work. Um, so there's that, as well as in combination with, and we talked about this both um, during the work session 
and the work session about reopening, there was that list of costs that are really the health and safety costs that we've delineated and outlined. That was about $15 million. So between the underspend that we expect in 1920, the CARES Act funding of $10 million, um, we feel like we are in a good position, as good as it gets in these circumstances, because there are a lot of unknowns, Director Mack, I totally agree with that. But we have flexibility built into our budget. We have identified pots of money that we're going to flex as needed. Um, the training for security, there's money built into people's budgets for security or for training. There's money built in for professional development. I know Director Harris had asked that question a couple times as well. So those are all of the ways that we're flexing. Again, kind of talked about um, at the work session and at the reopening um, work session uh, a couple weeks or maybe it was just last week. Uh, so those were ways that we had identified as being able to move the budget. The enrollment count hasn't changed. When we did the check-in in June, we were 60 students different than we were in February. So there, there weren't any telling signs that we needed to make any adjustments at that point in time. And then, um, as I stated earlier, our intent to enroll says most of our families want to come back to Seattle, almost all of them, and most of them want to come in person based on that, those um, survey results that we received on that intent to enroll. So I think that we're in a good position. There always are things that we need to prepare for, and I think that we have a budget that does that. I'd just like to reiterate something that Director Hampson talked about earlier. It's not about fixing and adopting the budget as a line item. Really, for school districts, and we've talked about this before, the school board is giving authority to spend. So they're approving an expenditure amount and a cap for how much we can spend during the year. Everything underneath that can flex and move as, as needed. I would pause there. I appreciate that. And then the flex and move as needed is one question. I have a, I think I'll ask my other question first, just, just for clarity, um, that this budget, budget does not include or expect that we will be providing a nurse in every building, not a full-time one, correct? That's correct. We had discussed that during the work session. I think that the board had talked about um, continuing curriculum as a priority. Okay. Um, and, and if I can just make a really clear statement about that, because um, I, I was one of the only dissenting, uh, maybe the only dissenting voice on on curriculum. It's something that Director Rankin and I have talked about extensively. Um, that I would prefer to see that money go go elsewhere. But it, they are very hard choices because of the that that question: Are we about health and safety and wellness, or are we about education? So um, I, I would, as in as uh, Chief Berge stated, if if that's something that the board wants to take a look at, I think it's important that we do um, have those considerations because they're they are very difficult choices to make. Well, and that gets to my second question. So thank you, Chandra, for that. Because my second question is the the question mark is flex is needed. I mean, having sat on this board, they, these these questions don't come back to us. We pass this budget and the the flex is needed, there's there's not a conversation with the board as to what will happen as the year goes on. We, we're talking about the next budget. We're not talking about the current year budget. And so what we are adopting today is, you know, is this matching? But and we approve every I have a question about how, how, so my, so Chandra, my question is specifically this, how do we flex as needed and what what is our board process in order to actually have that intersection going forward? Our board process is that we approve every expenditure above $250,000 currently, as well as significant other, um, like curriculum adoption, for example. Oh, so we don't approve, we don't approve like the decision to say, we, we don't, we're approving right now the plan on the school budgets, all of them. And however many staff they're gonna have, and nursing. So there, it's not going to come back to us as a question as to whether or not we really need to have a full-time nurse in every building. That's not going to come back because that doesn't, that's not a 250, if, that's, it's just not going to come back. So I don't understand the intersection we, with the board. We as a board have the capacity to make decisions 
around major spending items, if if we as a board decide in the future that we do not want to do curriculum adoption, which is how what is that? How many millions is that for sixth to eighth grade, Jolyn? Not doing curriculum, it's an, it isn't actually, that's a false choice. Whether or not we do curriculum adoption, there's underspend in the budget. There's actually dollars in places that can be considered and we're never looking at it in, as a whole picture. So my question, I guess, back to you as ANF chair is, we're what's not our at intersection on these large items if we're fixing this budget now we're, to potentially influence those in the future? It, it's not fixed. And as much as it's it's a budget, it's a projection, and it depending there you're conflating individual building staff assignments with budgeting, and and then ultimate placement of we're still in collective bargaining, so then the ultimate placement of staff and the resulting budgets. So we don't school districts don't unfortunately look back to actuals but they look much different than budgeted. So even when we get to September, individual building budgets are gonna look different than they did. Certain things are determined in as much as we can know them right now, but it is there is a lot of fluidity in this and a lot of decision points. Per, to Director Harris's point, have we described as a board what the school funding model should look like in this from the standpoint of say a, a superintendent procedure no we haven't directed the superintendent to do that yet and i believe that we should mm -hmm. however this is the system that we have now and there are many decision points if we choose to use them to work with staff collaboratively to make the adjustments that we're going to need to make as the fall comes my my quit my 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 statement back to you is that there isn't an actual effective board process in place at this moment for us to intersect on that. And I, I'm asking for having something because- Okay, so at this I point it doesn't don't exist. particularly so like the current process myself, and I'm looking forward to working on it per Director Hersey's comments, and that's always been one of, of my comments, but we came in in the middle of a process, so um, I well, think I'm just asking for the future, Dr Director Hanson. I'm just stating it as, as I think it's really something that needs to be. Well, yeah, worked. okay. So I appreciate I, your. I don't want to get your... into the whole, you know, history thing, but I think that that it's something that we that it doesn't necessarily make it um, a, a reason to not follow through on the process that we're required to complete, so that we can actually fund our schools. Yeah, I, you know. I, I appreciate that. I'm just I'm concerned that the bu budget hasn't been adjusted appropriately to what we already currently know. So that's where I'm sitting as a as a as a director with my fiduciary responsibility. I'm I'm nervous about whether or not this budget actually reflects what we already know, um, and whether or not uh, it has enough flexibility. And that is still a question mark in my mind. So I appreciate your commitment to helping move. Uh, in the future, the process uh, in a positive direction in terms of having the intersection of decision making around changes and the flexing as needed quote. Um, and I, at this point, I'll go ahead and rest. Thank you. D Director Mack, I'd just like to add one other thing. If there's something that we haven't responded to when asked, I would like to know, you know what that is. I've, Feel like we're generally responsive and that anything that we're asked to do by the board or present as far as the budget process that we um, do that and respond to that so if this is a new request or an additional request um, you know i'm happy to work with director hampson on that but i do feel like we have responded and provided the board with whatever information that we've been had requested of us um, during the work sessions and I understand your concerns about flexibility of the budget, um, but I also have, you know, I feel like we have developed a budget that does provide that flexibility. And this is a pandemic and we don't know what we don't know, but we are in as good a position as we could possibly be at this time. And I would stand uh, behind. 
Yeah, thank you. You know, uh, Ms. Berge, I want, I want to be clear that I, there's, there's not a question of whether or not staff has done their job or been responsive. So I, that I just, I don't, I don't want that to, what my comments and concerns to actually be heard as a personal question of whether or not uh, staff has been professional and responsive. I do, I do underscore what you just said, because yes, that is absolutely true. My question is around the, the overall process of the budget development and the intersection with the board around the flexibility as needed and whether or not um, there could be improvements made in that process. It's not about staff responsiveness. And I really appreciate that you have been. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Director Mack. Director Rankin. Hello. Um, I think that I would reiterate, uh, I mean, I have, I have something that has troubled me in general is that, um, because of time constraints and because of necessary requirements and everything, you know, we, we don't, we don't ever get the, and this is not a criticism. This is just a general reality. We don't ever get the opportunity to sort of like take a step back and say, okay, you know, what are our, you know, top, you know, top priorities. We, we don't get to start fresh. We can't start fresh because the, the processes are always, um, you know, overlapping and continuing. But I want to also, I guess, reemphasize what Director Hampson said is that a budget is a projection and a best guess um, as to the, the information that we have at the time. And it's not set in stone. Um, and that it is our responsibility to, you know, when different things come before the board to approve or not as, as we think fit, um, according to our, our values as a board and our priorities. Uh, so I don't necessarily, I don't have specific questions about this right now today. Um, but, uh, the curriculum, the curriculum discussion, I think is important for us to continue um because it, it is a big chunk of money but i also agree with director mack that it's a bit of a it's a false choice to say you know that is that it's a trade-off between curriculum or other things um and so i guess i would just hope that we can continue these conversations and also move forward in the the way that we need to to fund our buildings thank you director rankin Director Yvetta Smith. Hi. Um, yeah, I have a, actually a few questions here. So I'm going to just start with kind of an easy one, probably. Um, Chief Bergie, do we fund a full time counselor at every school in this budget? No, we do not. We provided a schedule of that to the board during one of the work sessions that talked about which elementary schools are still not funded and um, what that looks like as we phase in additional counselors. Okay, no, I appreciate that. I And I start with that one because um, in recognizing how long this has been in the works, I know that this is, I think um, Director Max said February, but this is, you know, we, this budget's been, been at least publicly working since you know, in the works since last October with the first work session um, that um, a few of us were not a part of because we were not on the board yet, but still, um, it has been a long process, and I, I appreciate that um, it's been that long brewing. Um, but I do remember that when we, we did come on this board, whenever in December, I think there was a work session, and a lot of us did vocalize, you know, our our priorities towards having counselors at every school. Um, so, and, and it's not to say that it magically happens, because I get we come in dreamy eyed, we come in, you know, on fire for the things that we know we want to fight for in these budgets and things we want to correct, and then sort of the I guess, for lack of a better word, the reality sets in of what you can do with only so much money. Um, but it, it, but those those aspirations don't go away. So um, just definitely want to keep it keep us true to you know our, our aspirations and not let us move too far from that because um, our community are depending on us for those. Um, likewise, um, I know that that's so go back going back to the last fall because I tried to go back and look at what we said and what we've done and what we asked. I, I see that um, last fall you shared that um, the new budget language allows for more general fund items to be charged to capital. I'm just wondering, did we do any of that in this budget? 
We did not. Um, that was something that was brought up a couple different times, but, but I, 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 I'm, I'm, I. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I think I you have an echo. Oh, sorry. Um, so that was something that was brought up as an option. The board did not provide staff direction to move in, in that direction. That is still an option. It remains an option for us. That is another place for flexibility, I guess I would say. Uh, if I could just, uh, I don't want to cut you off, Director Vera Smith. I just want to clarify that um, uh, over time, I would be more than happy to spend time with, with directors to um, help you get more familiar with GASB and and how um, school funding works there in, a, in any given point in time, there's a limited number of flexible dollars because most of our dollars come with significant uh, requirements in terms of how they're they're spent. So that's that's a large part of what um, Chief Bergie is talking about is what do we actually have the capacity? What do we actually have control over versus what is required to go directly into buildings and even then for certain purposes, right? Because that's how, how our funding models, I mean, even our grants that we get. So there's only a certain number of, of flexible dollars. So when we're making those very hard choices, even if it's to fund something that we all agree we need like counselors, but that the state hasn't funded us for, then we have to use our flexible dollars to fund that, which means we have to make a choice between that and something else. So, so that I hope that's helpful in terms of how, how you consider those things and how we consider them going forward in the coming months. Yeah, no, I, I'm very, very aware of, um, of dollars that are committed to, you know, that, uh, that, that we can't move. And I'm very aware of that. And I actually didn't even mean to imply by having that question follow my earlier comment that we would move anything for counselors. I'm sorry if it looked that way. That's actually... I, I didn't realize that that's how that would look. So um, yes, thank you for that, that again. Um, I was just, again, I'm going back through this whole year's process and trying to follow up and close in on things that have come up or been asked or talked about. So um, my next question, which actually fast forwards to just, I think the last work session or sometime recently we talked about this was about the um, one-on-one -on -one for elementary schools. We had discussed what we were gonna purchase for that. Was it decided where we go in what laptop type or iPads, what, what did that get? Did that loop get closed, Chief Berge? It did, I sent an email um, following up on that to all board directors. When After I sent the email, I did not receive any other feedback. So basically the plan is we will use our capital levy dollars in technology to purchase um, iPads for K2 and we will be purchasing other Chromebook laptop devices for uh, grades three through five. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I, um, and let me see. And then lastly, um, I think lastly, I hope I'm not, either way. So um, I think this is probably, this is just touches on a bit of what Director Mack was concerned with about how the, the budget isn't necessarily reflective of things we, we currently have numbers on. Um, for example, would be enrollment, um, which is a big one, right? I think by your own admission last year's enrollment projections, or at least the funding for them was very conservative and we had, um, a lot of classrooms, we had a shortage of teachers in some schools that um, was was definitely harmful to the way to start the school year. But I mean, you admitted, I remember that that was a very conservative budget uh, last year. Um, so going forward, as we look again, um, and I look at the budget book and I look at um, the enrollment projections that Ashley Davies shared with us for June. And in every high school, the enrollment projections um, are over what's budgeted for them. And I know we talked about this, uh, you and I, in a call recently. Um, and I'm just so I'm not here to, to torpedo this budget because for that reason, but I do want to understand what do we consider a safe number to be off on those projections, to be off on the funding versus projection? Because you know, maybe there's a margin of error where, like some of them, you know, it's it's not detrimental that we're off by like you know 40 students, but you know, like at Garfield High School, we're off by 195 um, versus right, their. Right. Can you just the question again? Yeah, so my question is, what's the margin of error that's safe to you? Because again, we're off by up to 195 students at Garfield. Um, we're, they're, they're projected to have missed a certain number, but our budget is only for less than it's for less than they're projected to have. So I'm just wondering, this is going to happen because again, this is a flexible document. I get that, um, or that you know. But what is what is the margin of error that's okay? Like, is there a number you could say where we miss it by a certain amount? That's probably okay. Rivera Smith, Chief Berge. Uh, yes, 
So um, in our fall adjustment flexibility number that we roll with, right, that we talked about during the work session, that's what that number represents. It's our enrollment and certainty number where we have money that we can add or replace if enrollment doesn't show up. So I think that we have about $6 million sitting in that line item. Yep, so that's a plan every year. We always have fall adjustment dollars that are sitting there um, to be deployed as needed. Okay, I mean, I guess that sort of, uh, that answers how we adjust for that. So thank you. Um, I'm looking through my list here. I'm sure I didn't forget anything, but I think that is all my questions for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director Heber Smith. Uh, Chief Berge, my question is only about, I think one thing that came up during Director Hampson's comments, just around our flexibility, um, given the board's prior consensus around prioritizing curriculum, given I think what we see down the line and certainly wanting to have more social emotional supports at our schools and potentially even just increasing capacity of our Kinney Vento department, for example, is is today too late to talk about the curriculum priority and any potential movements to actually putting more social emotional supports as well as opposed to prioritizing curriculum? No, I don't believe so. Um, I don't believe we haven't entered into any contractual arrangements. The curriculum work really is about when we when we commit those dollars, it's really when we've gone out for an RFP and have entered into a contract that would come to the board separately. Otherwise, it's about you know starting the internal meetings and things like that. Okay, thank you. Director Hampson, do you wanna close us out with any final comments or concerns? Um, yeah, I just, th you know, everyone's, comments, questions, and concerns are um, well-founded and appreciated. And I think it's a matter of trying to get us all on the same timing in terms of when we have these considerations and then also gaining a better understanding of um, our role in terms of fiscal decision-making as um, time goes throughout the year and as adjustments are made. I mean, as an indication with the, the curricular piece, um, you know, we, Every year, major um, shifts are made in terms of, of spending. And, um, you know, I have, I think, a slightly different sort of, or slightly stronger leaning towards health priorities um, right now than, than um, curricular, but that's just me, you know, personally. Um, and so I, I would hope that, that folks would consider um, wanting to have those conversations um, with me and with um, Chief Berge on a regular basis. We tend to get, contacted, I don't get contacted at all, or um, uh, Chief Berge gets con contacted separately. And so it's not, it doesn't become kind of a, there's not an opportunity for it to be a committee discussion. Um, and I think that, that that also makes the the process difficult because then you have information going out just sort of in little pockets. Um, so to the extent that we can we can bring those those collective, you know, even the, the, the um, questions that I hadn't noticed the the piece that the Wablock um, uh, students brought up around um, the the increase in that particular line item and um, was glad to have the opportunity to to gain that understanding. So um, it, it's just a matter of um, the the process that we that we utilize for it. Um, and I, I think it's going to be really important um, that we continue to ask these questions of ourselves and of um, staff as we uh, um, look at how to adapt um, and, and in many cases turn on a dime. So um, it, it's not for lack of appreciation for the, um, the critical eye, it's just a matter of, of getting um, in a better rhythm with one another and with the staff so that we can um, uh, kind of start the process out a little bit earlier and a little bit more on the same page next year. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Wilson-Jones, uh, roll call, please. Director Rivera-Smith. Abstain. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. 
Abstain, not personal. Aye. Director Mack? Abstain. Director Rankin? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. This motion has passed with a vote of four yes to zero no to three abstentions. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Thank you, Director Hampson and Chief Berge. We'll now move to item action at number four, approval of the 2020 through 2021 student rights and responsibilities at, or referred to as SRNR. This came to the Curriculum and Instruction, Instruction Policy Committee on June 9th for consideration. May I have a motion for this item, please? Sorry about that, forgot to take myself off mute. I move that the school board approve the 2020 to 2021 student rights and responsibilities document as attached to the board action report. Second the motion, Director Harris. Thank you. This item has been moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. This item has been updated since introduction. So Chief of Schools and Continuous Improvement, Wyeth Jesse, could you please brief us on that update? The, I'm not familiar with any update to the, this particular document, um, Director DeWolf. Um, I think he means generally. Chief Jesse, if you'd like to not comment, I can move on now. So now the agenda states that there was updates since introduction. I think is why you're calling that out. So I'm curious to know what those are. Chief Jesse, if you're not prepared to answer that, could you please provide somebody that can answer that question, please? Yeah, I'll go ahead and call on um, the head of our um, uh, behavioral response team. Uh, can Aaron Romanek go ahead and comment on this? Hi, good afternoon, Erin Romanek, uh, Student Support Services Supervisor. Um, the only thing that we added was a small paragraph to the bar, um, just stating our commitment to continue to look at this document. Um, I know there's a lot of discussion last time about um, approving this to have this ready for the, the school year, but there was some concern about needing to strengthen um, some of the anti-racist language and the commitments that we have as a district. And so the only thing that was added was a paragraph to the bar just saying that we commit to doing that um, in the fall it, with continued work um, with the school board. Thank you. Thank you for being prepared to answer that. OK, now we will move to directors for any comments or questions before we move to the vote. We'll start with Director Rankin as our Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee Chair. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I don't well. I'll just say um, I appreciate uh, Mr. Monick calling out the the added language for um, to re-examine it because as we as we did discuss at the last the last time this came up was that um, we agreed that the whole review process should start sooner so that will start in December I think and that also uh, we wanted to um, have the opportunity to strengthen some of the language in this based on. Some of the other policies so i think um i'm uh there's also um uh you know updates that are important for the coming year and so i'm i'm just no i don't know i'm just going to say i'm am grateful for the work that everyone's been doing and for the um, collaborative process and responsiveness on our concerns and i feel good that they've been addressed thanks director Rankin. my only other question is if you wanted to provide any context for why it was consideration versus approval when you uh, brought it to the full board? Um, when I, uh, I think the, the same the same considerations. We were we were thinking about the same things with regards to uh, restraint and isolation and discipline and some other policies, knowing that those were that was work that was ongoing and we wanted to make sure that this would uh, reflect it. 
Um, understood. Thank you. Director Hampson. Uh, yes, thank you. I, um, I, yeah, I would just want to concur that I do think this will need some additional work um, in conjunction with our uh, work session around our um, resolution support of black students, um, as well as as it pertains to uh, interactions with law enforcement and um, disproportionality and discipline um, uh, and our anti-racist um, policy. Um, but I think that the the current amendments are uh, warranted and that um, it's better to see these as living documents uh, that we come back to um, and so I'm comfortable moving forward with this knowing that we'll be coming back to it sooner rather than than later and in, in conjunction with a, a larger context. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Director Harris. Thanks very much, Aaron and your whole team. Thanks also for addressing the concerns about how we get pinch pointed every year in June, but we have to go to press, et cetera. Um, I'd like to start earlier. I'd like to finish earlier so we're not, not jammed up, but thanks again. Thank you, Director Harris. Director Hersey. No questions for me at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Yes, thank you. I, 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 I really do appreciate that added paragraph to the bar to clarify that there's additional work that will be going forward. And just to clarify uh, for the public and um, uh, that three, uh, myself and two other colleagues made a work request that um, there would be a review of the policies and associated procedures that ensure student safety in regard to and prevention of and response to harm to students um, in direct uh, alignment with the resolution that we recently passed as well as some other previous directives and that this um, this handbook is part of that review as well as another I don't know 10 11 different policies and that's the reference that director Hampson was just making about the work session in um, August. So um, appreciate uh, the conversation and the ongoing work and um, look forward to approving this as it is knowing that we are going to continue revising and working on it being better in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rankin. I started us off. And my apologies. Thank you, Director. Mm -hmm. Hi, yes, um, no, I, uh, I agree um, that um, it's important to get this passed now so that we're, because the default is a previous um, student rights and responsibilities handbook, which we all agree was not adequate. So I appreciate that we are committing to um, furthering the work as we go on. Um, no other questions or comments, thank you. Thank you, Director Rivera-Smith. And uh, I, again, I appreciate the, the addition of that paragraph and just for clarity, the resolution that directors uh, Hampson, Hersey, and I wrote, uh, one of the parts of that was putting on a work session to talk about the policies that would be implicated by that resolution. And I understand our legal counsel has a list of about 12. Uh, and I think we'll, we have a work session potentially scheduled for the 12th. And so please be on the lookout for that. Uh, so as of that, Ms. Wilson-Jones, roll call, please. Um, Director Hampson? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. Director Hersey? Aye. Aye. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Vera Smith? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next item is item action item number five, approval of the new board policy number 3211, gender inclusive schools, transgender and gender expansive student rights and supports. This came to the curriculum instruction policy committee on June 9th for approval. May I have a motion for this item, please? This is Director Hampson. 
One moment. I move that the school board approve board policy number 3211, gender inclusive schools, transgender and gender expansive student rights and supports as attached to the board action report. Second the motion, Director Harris. Thank you. This item has been moved by direct, Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. We'll now move to directors for any comments or questions for Mr. Jesse before we vote. When we will begin with Director Rankin, who is our Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee Chair. Um, hi. I, I don't. I don't have any additional information. I don't think we've had um, pretty good conversations around this, and um, it was uh, very um, unanimously supported. There wasn't a lot of, uh, of controversy or discussion about what should or shouldn't be included, and uh, it's it's really critical. And I'm really pleased that we're bringing it forward. Thank you, Director Hampson. Uh, no question. Really um, happy to be supporting this. Thank you, Director Harris. Ditto on that. Most definitely in support. Thank you, Director Harris. Director Percy. None for me. Thank you. Let's get it done. Thank you, Director Mack. Uh, no questions or comments. Excited to go ahead and vote. Thank you. Director Rankin. You already, I started. <laughs> oh Director Rebetta Smith. Uh, yeah, no questions. Um, deep appreciation and excited. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rebetta Smith. Uh, and I would like to just uh, ask uh, Senior Legal Counsel Ronald Boy if he wanted to provide any additional last minute comments. I know that he worked a lot on this. And this does have an intersection with the LGBTQ resolution that we passed on June 10th. So this does correspond. And this is one of the policies that we listed as one that should follow that resolution. So just want to make sure that our community sees that through resolution, here's a policy that we've, we've, we've brought forward. So if Ronald Boyd is on the line and wanted to share just any background or any other final comments before we move to the vote. Uh, thank you, President DeWolf. Um, I would just like to say that I, I'm just so happy that we're here today. Um, over the past almost decade now, we've had uh, really expansive student rights and support and student rights and supports for transgender students. And I'm just so happy to see that this is uh, this policy will give those rights and supports a lot more visibility and just really send a, a strong message to our families and our students that Seattle Public Schools are a welcoming place for all. Thank you so much. Ms. Wilson-Jones, roll call, please. Director Harris. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Okay, we will now move to item number six, amend board policy number 3207, prohibition of harassment, intimidation, and bullying. This came through the Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee on June 9th for consideration. May I have a motion for this item, please? This is Director Hampson. I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to execute a contract with Northwest Education Association in the amount of $425,000 for 2020 to 21. I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. Not. Thank yeah, you. No. Yep. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I move that the school board amend po board policy number 3207, prohibition of harassment, intimidation, and bullying as attached to this school board action report. Second the motion, Director Harris. Thank you, Director Ham. Thank you for uh, moving the item, Director Hampson, and for seconding Director Harris. This item has been updated since introduction. So Chief Human Resources Officer, Dr. Clover Codd, will you please provide us a brief update on that? 
Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, just for your reference, we did add the current superintendent procedure to 3207 uh, and the WASDA model procedure for 3207 in the um, new or uh, revised policy that you're voting on today. The superintendent is directed to develop procedures or um, edit procedures to be in line with the policy. And so we just wanted to put those there for your reference. Understood. Thank you. Now I will move to directors for any comments or questions before we move to the vote, uh, beginning with Director Rankin, who is our Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee Chair. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Codd, for the, um, the hi highlighting what was added. I really appreciated that. Reading through this again um, yesterday, the inclusion of, of those accompanying uh, documents. Um, this this policy uh, came through CNI, and and we had considerable discussion around it. Um, some some to clarify some language, some to you know make sure that it was in line with other policies and um, centering students that uh, we you know we were trying to focus on. And so a lot of that was was feedback was received and incorporated. So thank you very much. And um, to all who contributed that to, to those discussions as well. Uh, similar with the students rights and responsibilities um, piece, this was another uh, policy that will be considered under the work session um, to look at you know, several policies that involve uh, discipline and safety. And so um, you know, knowing that it's, as with the students' rights and responsibilities, there are some important updates and um, and uh, and then some further review and, and possibly strengthening of languages, but uh, of language. But um, I just thank you all for the thoughtful work around this because it, it did it did kind of go back and forth and have new iterations and new you know feedback and stuff. So um, uh, yeah, it's an important important document, important policy. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Hampson. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of the same um, concern when we when it was brought for intro. Uh, I definitely had concerns because of uh, the potential uh, for this to to negatively or at least not positively impact uh, our the, the ability of our students uh, to have, which is specific. We do have this same policy as it pertains to adults. Uh, this is the student the student policy, and um, as we are looking at our uh, very important uh, commitment to lessen uh, the disproportionality in um, uh, discipline and the impact of uh, discrimination and and racism on our on our students in our buildings, uh, this is a critical policy. Um, and is something that I look forward to considering it during the work session. And, but that being said, I, I think the um, it, it's actually works out well timing wise to have this come forward with a directive around the procedure such that then the procedure can be developing in concert with our work uh, around uh, the 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 work session associated with all with the resolution and all the policies that we need to consider. So. Um, for that reason, I'm supporting it this moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hampson. Director Harris. I'm conflicted about this. I do appreciate this, the procedures being attached to it for clarity, but I'd really like to see the proposed procedures to go with it. And if we're having a work session on this, I guess I'd like to see this more um, fleshed out, if you will, with both coming at the same time. Um, we have several, frankly, embarrassing and heartbreaking issues where our policies have not um, been that effective in exiting folks because they're so wonderfully vague. I think I'm probably going to abstain, but I'm more than happy to listen to the rest of my colleagues. Thank you. 
office director Hussein. Um, yeah, so we've talked about this extensively, um, and I think that this current version has gotten uh, to the changes that were requested originally in committee. So I think we are prepared to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hersey. Director Mack. Yes, thank you. Um, this is one of the policies that is on that list of review. Um, and I really appreciate uh, the adjustments that have been made in response and that that these amendments that are currently in here, I think are important to, to, to codify at this stage. And I, um, you know, reviewing this and, and, go, and looking at the uh, WASDA model policy and our, uh, and their model procedure and our procedure and what's in policy and what's not, there's, um, there's still, in my opinion, some pretty significant gaps that I look forward to uh, discussing about how we may want to um, resolve them. One of the things that uh, causes me concern is around the investigations uh, piece and how those are done and whether or not they're impartial. Um, presently, the procedure um, uh, designates, in our procedure, designates the building leader. Um, but in the WASDA procedure, it says, or district designee. Um, and I think this is something that we may want to consider from a policy perspective that the investigation uh, should be uh, independent of HR um, and independent um, of uh, even uh, the building leader uh, in, in order to be really responsive. Um, so I'm throwing that out there as a concept and one of the things that I, I see as a policy gap that I'd like to have further conversation on in the future. The other piece that is, um, and this has come up that, you know, a lot of this isn't, isn't even, you know, it, it's directed in RCW around school resources officers that they need to have a certain amount of training. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, it isn't required, there isn't specific requirements for training for various personnel um, around things that I think we need to um, require uh, in, to ensure that our, our staff are uh, well-versed in de-escalation techniques and implicit bias. And, and those are all the conversations that I know we're, we're gonna be having, but I think that's another opportunity for this policy in the future uh, to consider. Um, and uh, those are my kind of two main points that I look forward to having further conversation about um, whether or not the policy needs to be strengthened to do that, or if the procedures can um, can be written in such a way that they're responsive to those um, concerns. So um, at this point, I'll be supporting this uh, today because the uh, amendments are, are actually really, really important to get um, codified now. And um, I look forward to the continued work. And thank you to staff for uh, the conversation and, and um, continuing to, um, to do this work. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Director Rivetta Smith. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? I sure can. Okay, I'm just not using a headset anymore. Um, no. Um, Likewise, I appreciate that we're going to continue um, diving into policies such as these as we as we um, get more information and have more discussions regarding um, the threat assessment policy that's being worked on and how it relates to so many other of our policies that we um, that are interconnected. Um, I have a question just for clarification. Um, I'm, so I'm looking and I, I understood. I heard that the superintendent procedures were included, and but I I'm confused. I only see the old 2000. 2018 one. Was there a new one I should be seeing that I'm not seeing? Um, or was that, or were you just saying you've added the current one? Director Rivera Smith, no. The the this is the current one. This is not revised, but okay. we added them just for your reference so you could see what was in our current procedure and what's in current WASDA model procedure. Um, with the understanding that there's going to be much more discussion as we move into editing our uh, procedure for this as we um, become more and more in alignment with the, the school board's resolution in support of our black students. 
All right, great. That's that's just want to make sure that was what I was seeing too. So okay, um, yes, um, no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rivera Smith. Um, and I have no further questions at this time. Thank you for that update uh, and that clarity, Dr. Cod. Um, with that, Ms. Wilson Jones, please call. Please roll call, please. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye, y'all convinced me. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Jones. We will now move to action item number seven, approval of contract with Northwest Education Association to increase measures of academic progress, map, testing and professional development. This came through curriculum and instruction policy committee on June 9th for approval. May I have a motion for this item, please? I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to execute a contract with Northwest Education Association in the amount of $425,000 for 2020 to 21 in the form of the draft agreement and attached to the school board action report with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the contract. Second the motion, Director Harris. Thank you, directors. This item was moved by Director Hampson and seconded by Director Harris. We will now move to directors for any comments or questions for Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Diana Backer, before we vote. Again, we'll start with Director Rankin as our Curriculum and Instruction Policy Committee Chair. Thank you. Um, this, oh, this item is, uh, earlier I was talking about tension between opposing opposing sentiments and opposing forces. And that's how I feel about about this item. Um, I am really grateful to uh, Audrey Roach, head of assessments for uh, taking the time to um, have a meeting with me and with Dr. DeBacker at the beginning of this process when, when it was uh, uh, on its way to CNI. And um, I, so, in general, I am not I'm not supportive of standardized testing, especially as it has historically been used to uh, be a punitive measure, and it used to be tied to teacher assessment, which thank goodness that's not where we're at anymore. Um, but so my conflict with this item lies in uh, that sort of um, you know, historical issues with standardized testing and my own feelings about participation in them. Um, and with the, the paired uh, tension of needing, needing a data point to, uh, you know, everything that we do is attached to, to data. And I mean, I, <sighs> I'm wondering about um, dispersal of resources and funding that goes, you know, that is targeted to students that most in need and how are we highlighting where the need is if we don't have any data points to go on um, and we don't have SBAC and SBAC, I, you know, can, as far as I'm concerned, we can never see again, um, but we don't have that, we don't have any data from this spring. And so, um, and in discussing with Ms. Roach about, you know, this being low stakes and uh, it's a small time commitment and, you know, in the bar, as I hope everyone read the full packet, uh, it specifically notes uh, some discussion that we had, which was really ensuring that uh, professional development and training for the test administration of the test was in place to ensure that, you know, kids are not being tested on their disability or, um, you know, uh, uh, comprehension of, of English language if they're an English language learner that we that we have those supports in place to ensure that you know we're getting accurate accurate assessment um so those are my conflicts and I know a lot of my my uh, uh, 
the other members of the committee have we have expressed similar similar conflicts and concern uh, but generally agree that we need a data point and this may not be perfect but that this is the the kind of the option that we have so one question that i do have that i would like to ask um dr tobacco that i didn't don't have an answer to yet leading up to this was that the um it's not an insignificant piece you know chunk of money and you know going dealing with a crisis and all these other unknowns you know i take that very seriously and so my question is as of right now my understanding is that the map is administered in person so were are were we to approve this and then we're, should testing in person not be possible, is that money gone forever or is there a, a, a take back clause or something um, if we aren't able to administer uh, the test in person? And then a second question would be, is there a percentage of student that we feel like we would need to ensure in-person testing to make the results um valuable so say for example if if we can get in person but it's only 75 percent of students is that still uh worth it um thank you this is diane debacker um in response to your question director rankin about if we are not in person um I'll, I'll address, I think, a, a, a larger question around we do not anticipate nor do we support giving this assessment remotely. So if by chance we do not have the opportunity to give this, um, this assessment in person, we will choose not to do it remotely. I am not aware that we have anything within our contract at this point that um, that we would be able to either get that money back or move it to maybe the next school year. Um, I have not looked at the contract in that manner and I've not asked um, uh, uh, Chief Counsel Greg Narver to look at that either. Okay, I guess then a follow up to that would be, what would be, would there be an opportunity to bring this item back closer to the point at which we know if we're able to administer it in person or not? Or is it? Um, yeah, I, I, the, the assumption is that we will have students um, in person in school at, at the beginning of this school year. So um, the next opportunity that we could bring this would be um, in your August board meeting or even at the end of August, um, but I, I'm not sure that that would make much of a difference at, at this point. Well, the, I, well, so if, if it wouldn't, I, I would ask or suggest that if there is not a serious negative consequence to us not voting on this today and waiting, to, waiting to know if we can get money back if we enter into a contract and it's not administered, or waiting till we know more certainly if we will or will not have students in person, then I guess I would ask us to not make this decision today. I'd happily second that motion. Director Harris. I think there's some feedback. Um, I'd happily second that motion. Director Harris. Hi, this is Audrey um, Roach. I'm the assessment uh, program development manager, development program manager. Um, there, like Diane says, we can talk to, to uh, the contract person uh, that we work with pretty closely. I just texted her because I'm because um, I just heard your questions. So, um, and she gets back to me pretty quickly. But um, I, we are up against a little bit of a just a time frame um, as far as. Um, setting up time for PD. Um, so there's there's not much time from here on out to get to get the teachers and the leaders. Um, just to be aware, I just want you to be aware that where we are right now, I have about a month and a half before school uh, picks up and uh, we will not be able to provide teachers professional development in September. So I've had to push this to um, an August date. 
So I just need you to be like, this is all going to be happening all at once. Um, I want you to be aware of that. As far as um, getting money back from the contract, um, I asked this person now, um, technically, they usually parse out the cost of the students that you, how many licenses are used during the school year. Does that make sense? So if, if we get to the place where we contract out for all the students in K, I'm sorry, in K-8, and we have some students who don't test, then the question is, do we get money back for those students? And I want to say yes, but I've, again, I'm going to text her and, and or email her and ask her that question. Um, I just want to, to impress upon the, the board the time frame that we're in, and this is this is um, and this is just where we are. It's an exceptional situation, and um, the more up in the air we are, and the more we don't have certainty around this, is teachers are asking me, and leaders are asking me for this, and and I just need you to understand where I'm coming from and where the department's coming from in support of staff and schools, and. Um, Obviously, I'm happy to do whatever the board decides. I mean, no doubt, but we are in a time crunch right now, and I and it's hard for me to plan for this. The more we wait, um, President DeWolf, um, we, if you, if you would like, we could move this item to the end of the agenda while we wait to see if our contractor gets back in touch with us. If you would like us to do that, I would. I would yield to our uh, chair of CNI if that. I I would say that at this point right now, without answers to that question, that I would have to vote no. Um, so if we want to wait and see what that information is, um, if that means waiting till the end of this meeting, then let's do that. Okay. Um, uh, myself and uh, Miss Roach will will do some work in the interim. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, Greg, thank you. Greg, okay. Greg, my only question, Greg, is um, do we need to do anything language here to clarify we're moving to a new item? Can you remind me on procedure here? I, I think uh, you have a clear record that this item is just being moved to later in the meeting. I don't think any uh, motion or formal procedure is needed to do that. Director DeWolf? Yes, Director Hampson. Um, I, before we leave this item, um, I, because I have to go somewhere at five, so I'm concerned about not being able to get back to it. I'd like to know if I can ask my questions because that are not related to the the um, potential refund. I am going to say let's pause. I think our next two items, I hope we can get through fairly quickly to come right back to this. So um, if in the next 10 minutes we're not through the next two, I will make sure to come back to you. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. We will now move to action item number eight, 2019 through 2020 City of Seattle Summer Food Service Program Project Services Agreement. This came to the Executive Committee on June 17th for approval. We have a motion for this item, please. Oh, you could, if I could find my. <laughs> uh, I oh, lost sorry. my document. Hold on. Good. One more pause. Understood. Director Hanson, you want me just to read it in and you second? Sure, go ahead. This action item number eight, 2019 20, City of Seattle Summer Food Service Program Project Services. This came before Exec Committee June 17 for approval. Approval of this item would authorize the superintendent to enter into a project services agreement with the City of Seattle to receive payment of up to $587,620 to provide breakfast, lunch, and afternoon snacks for the City of Seattle's Summer Food Service Program with any minor additions, deletions, modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary action to implement the contract. Do I hear a second? Second. This is Director Hampson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris, for the, uh, I don't know the sports term, but I think Hail Mary there. Um, we will now move to- Pinch Brittany. hitting. Thank you. Johnny Thank hitter. <laughs> for, thank you for moving the item, Director Harris, and seconding Director Hampson. We'll now move to directors for any comments or questions for Chief Operations Officer Fred Podesta before we vote. As Executive Committee Chair, I will begin. I don't have any other questions uh, or comments from our last conversation two weeks ago. 
Fred, so I'll move in uh, to Director Hampson. Uh, no questions for me, thank you. Glad we're able to do this. Thank you, Director Harris. None, I do want to point out though that we had good hard questions from my friends at the city of Seattle as to why this was so late and those were answered. And yay to Aaron Smith and the nutrition team for making this work work. Thank you. Director Hersey. None for me, thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Um, I correct me if I'm wrong, but this would typically come through ops. I looked at this and whoa, this is, I, I think over the last couple of years, we've approved a similar contract, correct? Chief Podesta? This yes, is an that's annual correct. Thing. That's correct. As Director Harris noted, the city was a little bit late delivering the contract to us. And so our last opportunity for any committee meeting was exec to get this all executed in time um, to, I will confess that we did in fact produce meals yesterday for this program, even though this is being approved now. Um, and the, the delay on the part of the city was because of the COVID-19 situation, they were firming up the locations they would be able to distribute meals, what would be open, what wouldn't be open, and um, we're having trouble firming up the contract. So it just became a timing issue because yeah, no they- worries delayed. No worries. I, I, I totally get it. And I, I assume it was on intro last uh, meeting and I missed that because I uh, was I missed the last portion of the meeting. So I apologize. But I do have a quick question about the, the numbers here. Um, the payment is 587000 But is our budget or expected uh, summer food service program expected to be much larger than that? I'm assuming since we're going to be continuing to provide food service, do we, and I did not think to ask this ahead of time, so I know I'm putting you on the spot, but so what's the are, total amount over the summer? I um, uh, don't have that number in front of me. That's a different funding source. So this, this is the city's program. These meals will be dis delivered at approximately 40 city sites. Um, okay. Because we have okay. a waiver through August, we are getting state funding to continue our program through the seamless service option. And so we will continue to get state funding um, to fund the USDA funding to fund as well, you know, through the state um, to fund our program through August. And so um, we're producing about 8,000 meals a day um, that are feeding about 8,000 students per day. And this was another 2,000 students per day that the city is funding and distributing at their own locations. Aha, uh -huh. that's great. So yay. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. It's good okay. news for the community. Yes. Thank okay. Thank I rest then. Thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Director Rankin. Nope. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rivetta Smith. Thank you. Um, no, I um, I don't have any questions really. I just, um, as somebody who spent many summers um, going to the local school to get a meal for the summer, I, I definitely appreciate that we have these um, efforts that we carry out and have funding for. Um, so from the bottom of my heart, no, no questions, comments, just appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Wilson-Jones, roll call please. Oh, please. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Percy. Aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next item is item number nine. <clears throat> BEX 5, approval to fund a school-based health center at NOVA at Horace Mann School from the BEX 5 Program Placement Fund. This came to the Operations Committee on June 4th for approval. We have a motion for this item, please. Happy to help. Director Hampson. Director Hampson. Go ahead, Director. Don't, don't move, move the item. 
Action item number nine, VEX five, approval to fund a school-based health center at Nova at Horace Mann School from the VEX five program placement fund. This came before ops June four for approval. Approval of this item would authorize the superintendent to transfer $250,000 from the VEX five program placement cost center to fund design services and construction for a school-based health center at Nova at Horace Mann School. Seconded. This is Director Hampson. Apologies. I was on mute that time. Clearly, my toggling skills leave much to be desired. Hello? Hello. I was also on mute. <laughs> Thank you to Director Harris for <laughs> seconding. We'll now move oh. to Director Sweeney for Chief before we vote. Given that this is an operations item, we'll start with Director Mack, who is our operations committee chair. Um, yeah, this was intro. Uh, so I wasn't there for this portion of the discussion, but um, assume you all had a robust discussion last meeting and uh, we pushed it through for approval because this is a super important project and I just encourage voting yes. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hampson. No questions, thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Very pleased to, to see this come to fruition. Um, NOVA, like many other alternative schools, has been treated a bit like a redheaded stepchild, and they have a population that is unique, and I'm very pleased to see that we are looking to meet their needs. Thank you. Director Hersey. No question for me. Just want to also um, flag that we are excited to um, be in some potential conversations with Africatown about reclaiming space there. Um, and, you know, that, that just provides even greater context in this moment, especially knowing the benefits of wraparound services and the potential for us to enter into um, an additional MOU. This doesn't just stand to serve the uh, students at NOVA, but also the community and the surrounding areas. And this is this is really the type of change that we need to see in terms of making sure that our resources go to the communities that need them the most. And then also, you know, frankly, being creative about how do we provide access um, to individuals who could typically be outside of the schooling system as well. So excited to see this um, go forward, excited to continue conversations about how we can, you know, continue to provide access to those who need it most. Thank you, Director Hersey. Director Mack. I already spoke. I'm sorry. Thank you, Director Rankin. Um, no, I am excited about this. And I remember, uh, of course, I don't remember when it was. It was last year or the year before because time has no meaning anymore. But um, the advocacy of NOVA students was really powerful um, and the need for them to have a school-based health center in particular, in particular one that met the needs of their student population, a high percentage of which are LGBTQ. So um, I'm, I'm excited that their advocacy has paid off and here we are. Absolutely, thank you. Director Rivetta Smith. Um, hi, no, thank you. Yeah, I'm actually, um, I was already excited about this and now doubly excited when I to hear um, Dr. Hershey's uh, news about working with Africa Town to reclaim space there. I remember, um, how was it, like 12 years ago now, um, when NOVA moved out and a local organization, Work It Out Seattle, moved in, and along with um, Africa Town and other, other uh, CBOs that use that space. And that was that was very special to have the ability to do that. Um, just, I'm glad, you know, I kind of, but I, I'm glad I never got back in, definitely. Um, I know that that was a dear space to them too, but finding ways to share it um, is awesome. So I look forward to more on that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I don't have any other comments. I'm really excited to see this. I know I uh, was really grateful for to the city uh, for adding this uh, advocacy that worked out there to include some initial startup costs for this as well in the FEP levy. So thank you to the voters for that. Uh, and thanks um, for your work on this and operations committee. Uh, so Ms. Wilson-Jones, roll call, please.
Director R Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Mack. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we will now move to I will move backward to item number seven, and I will call on Director Rankin as Curriculum Instruction Policy Committee Chair to just lead us through the final discussion uh, with Chief DeBecker. Okay. Um, let's see, Dr. DeBecker, do we have any further information? We do. Uh, thank you, Director Rankin. Uh, we have heard from our account manager at the Northwest Education Association, and she's indicated that any unused licenses from the contract can be credited forward, applied to additional services, or refunded back to the district. That's great. So, so the, the amount of the contract is really in up to this amount? Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I would like to know if directors have other questions. Okay, we'll start with Director Hampson. I know she had some burning questions. Okay, yeah, and then, um, uh, so uh, that's good news that we aren't, wouldn't be making a um, irreversible fiscal choice. Um, the concern that I have is even if we are there in person, we'll have arguably 10% of our students not able to be present to take this in person. And so there, I have some equity concerns there. I also have concerns about if we're, if we're, I'm actually more concerned about the fact that we're looking to implement this right when we get back in the fall and that among all the things that are staff are going to need in order to prepare for receiving students back that testing PD would be prioritized. And furthermore, that when students come back into the fold, that the first thing that is going to happen to them is that they're going to be tested. Um, I think there's an element of uh, potential trauma for, for kids. There are kids that are already undergoing a fair amount of trauma. Um, and the idea that that the first thing that we do for our own you know benefit as a system because we're not required we we've heard that that ESPA is the OSPI is is applying for a waiver of ESPA. Um, I'm I'm not necessarily anti-assessment, uh, and I know I've heard from many teachers that this is in fact the one that they prefer. I'm very concerned about. A, what we actually believe we're going to be able to accomplish with this data, that's not um, super clear to me. And I'm very concerned about be this being one of the first thing ways that we engage with our students and with our teachers is preparing for a standardized test. And I'm just, I'm really struggling to get over my comfort level with that. Thank you, Director Hampson. I think, um, I mean, that is a, we, we have the same concerns on our mind that as students come back into the classroom, um, the first thing that we need to do and during the first couple weeks is we we definitely need to attend to their social and emotional state of mind and making sure that they are um, feel comfortable back in school, that they uh, feel welcome back in our buildings and that they're they're ready to learn and, and they aren't they won't be ready to learn if they're still um, dealing with the trauma of the school closure. So uh, we would not do any assessment um, or administer any of the MAP assessments until at the earliest um, would be about the second uh, week that we're into school, but that can go all the way out into the middle of October. So we have a large window there, my guess, and, and being a former school principal, I would be choosing to do that during the last part of the window. Thank you. So we'll move now to Director Harris. Uh, as is pretty well known, I have significant concerns about culturally inappropriate 
high stakes testing and labeling children. I'm thrilled to death that SDAC has uh, disappeared and I'm with Director Rankin. I hope we never, ever see it again. Uh, the history with NWEA in this district and with the former superintendent Goodlow Johnson is horrific. I'll be voting no and I, I well appreciate and again, it's not personal, the desire for data, but we've got pretty remarkable teachers that can do a good job of giving us information and plugging it in to some of the resources that we already have. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hersey. You know, and this for me is um, a complex matter as well, thinking about the area in which we find ourselves versus uh, my personal feelings about where our district should be heading in terms of standardized testing. Um, I think that earlier when we spoke about this and Director Rankin asked um, some clarifying questions that answered it for me, I do just wanna make clear that while this might not necessarily be the intersection for us to have this conversation, as we begin to reimagine um, how schools are not only safer for our students in terms of uh, their physical presence um, but, and their you know, immunological health, um, we, we also need to start thinking about when we, re, when we say we're gonna reimagine schools, we, we actually have to do that. And I think that testing and, and assessing its efficacy um, in the coming months is going to be a part of that conversation and it definitely needs to be a part of that conversation. So um, in this moment, I, I feel satisfied with where we are with this particular measure, but I do wanna make it very clear that I'm going to be expecting us to have a conversation around testing more broadly um, and its efficacy and usefulness in our district uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you, Director Thank you. Director Mack. Yeah, I don't. I don't have any questions or comments at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Director uh, Rivera Smith. No questions or comments. Thank you. Okay, and I have none at this time. Uh, a pretty well, um, pretty robust conversation. So I appreciate that from directors. So, uh, knowing that, uh, Miss Wilson Jones, um, roll call, please. Director Mack. Director Mack? Aye. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Rivera-Smith? Aye. Director Hampson? Nay. Director Harris? Nay. Director Hersey? Abstain. Director DeWolf? Director DeWolf? Yes. This motion has passed with a vote of four, four yes to two no to one abstention. Okay. We are now to the portion of the agenda where uh, directors who did not provide comments are, are welcome to provide comments. We are about nine minutes until our scheduled time is over. I really appreciate all of your uh, stamina getting through this last um, almost five hours. Um, I know Director Hampson has spoken. Uh, Director Harris? I, I wanna give a huge thank you to our staff and to my colleagues, um, these are bizarro times and I think everybody's working hard. And whatever conflicts we have, I think are opportunities and I miss y'all exceptionally much. And um, my hope is to have a community meeting on Zoom or Teams or some such. And I welcome another director, I know that uh, Director Savetta Smith helped set one up before, so my hope is I can figure out how to do one before the end of July, and I'm just sorry we're not doing lasagna. Um, I am extremely troubled by the polarization out there, by what the um, gentleman in the White House, using the term loosely, had to say about returning to school and uh, 
Secretary Betsy DeVos yesterday, and and I am um, I'm not convinced we're going back. I think we're going to spike again, and it's it's our children's and students and staff lives at stake. So I'm holding my breath. But again, miss you very much, and hugely thankful. Thank you. I think Director Mack, you have any comments? Ooh, we're at the end of the meeting. We're actually a few minutes before. Um, we have a couple of directors too, so just a reminder. Yep. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that most of the folks that came for testimony are likely not on the call anymore, but I just want to uh, appreciate that they did come out and, uh, and, and raise an issue. Um, I do think this, the process that we go through um, for principal appointments uh, in the district is inconsistent in the community engagement. And I would urge uh, and the superintendent to uh, take a look at that, those processes and uh, potentially uh, <clears throat> review uh, the testimony that was coming in um, for the comments that community are raising um, around Leshi and um, further appreciate that there's more work to be done on uh, the planning for the fall and we've got a lot in front of us and appreciate uh, continued collaboration on the board to work together to um, move these things forward. So thank you. Thank you, Director Mack. Direct, did I have any more directors? Director, I think that might have been everybody. Did any directors have any final comments? I, or I, go on. Oh, Director, Director yes. thank you. Sorry, um, no, I, I, yeah, I know. I, I forget who didn't speak earlier too, but I, I, I know I didn't, um, but I want to just, um, like um, Director Mack, I, I really want to address um, the speakers who came today. Um, so many, um, and there's so much to unpack there that um, I know nothing I say will do it justice, but when, when, when dozens of people come out to speak on something, show their concerns, um, you know, I feel like we need to respond to in some degree. And um, sharing their concerns, demands, and for transparency and accountability. My heart truly does break for them because as a, as a you know, person of color myself, I know how it feels to be disregarded, disrespected, and, and it does fire you up. And it makes you, you know, want to cry out to whoever will listen that you demand justice. And the worst thing I think we can do at this point is to not answer that call with, at the very least, conversation. And, um, and I, I saw um, Chief Jesse sent an email to us earlier um, which addressed some of the moving forward efforts at Leshai. Um, and, um, but, you know, but when principles change for both placements and removals, you know, that is ultimately a superintendent's call. Um, and I, so, you know, I would humbly ask that Superintendent Juno meet with the community herself. Um, and I'm very aware that with HR matters, you, you do not allow for certain information to be shared publicly. And I feel for Superintendent Juno in that regard, because I know as much as she may want to, you know, truly want to um, address their concerns with, with details and specifics regarding the, their big question of why. I mean, I know that, you know, she, she can't necessarily do that. And that's hard to play, that's a hard spot to be in. Um, and, but putting aside, you know, those legal restraints, this community is clearly hurting. And regardless of whether or not the principal's removal was right or wrong, um, I'm, I, not speaking on that, but but regardless of that, there there is definitely some healing that needs to take place there. Um, and in my opinion, that doesn't happen with proxies. That happens, um, you know, with the superintendent speaking community. And I I want just I just want us to lose sight of that community needs to you know feel these just feel listened to. And and I hope that we can find ways to do that. Um, no further questions or comments. No further comments. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rivera-Smith. Um, with that, there is no further. Can I really, I just want to really quickly add to that, that the, uh, this is Director Rankin, that, and I spoke before, before all of the public testimony. So I just wanted to add that the, um, 
it, uh, part of what was so frustrating about hearing those the comments from the Leshai families is that this we keep doing this to families and to communities as a district, and we have to stop doing it. Like this unnecessary stress and and strife and turmoil and that a lot of times it's not it's not what has happened but it's how it happened um that that we just have to consider the impact of this on real people and real families and how confusing and hurtful it is to have um changes like this made with and have it and feel blindsided by it so i just wanted to state again that you know thank you to the Lashai for community for for coming and talking to us today and um, we we and just to everybody else, we have to stop doing this to people. And also, Mr. Liu is one of the best principals out there, and so they're lucky to have him, and they're accepting him in a way that is harder on all of them, and it was totally unnecessary. So, thank you. Thank you, Director Rinkin. And uh, just a final reiteration of our gratitude, not only to the staff for your work, um, not only to the directors for sticking through it, but also to our community and particularly our, our families from Leshai for bringing your voice and your experience to today's meeting. Uh, with that, there being no further business to become before the board today, the regular board meeting is now adjourned at 4.59 p.m. Thank you all.